And all one minute board has gone up. 39 cars on the grid. It's going to be a frantic first lap. Really, the story of the race may be told in the early stages because of the crush into the first couple of corners there. We hope we won't see too many incidents as the balloons are set off with 30 seconds to go. One car into the pits, Tony. One car being pushed into the pits in the back of the grid. So somebody not even going to get a start. That won't be on the minds of the people like Andy Rouse and Robbie Francovic on the front. Dick Johnson behind them. Peter Brock. Trevor Crow. Alan Grice. Expect a sensational start from Johnson. He'll try hard in that black car, number 17. He'll go for the slot. So will Peter Brock. There could be a real squeeze here. They're away. Bear in mind, the turbos are not supposed to be as fast off the start, but these two getting away beautifully. And it's the Volvo of Francovic at first. He's going to squeeze Rouse out. Brock's got into third place. So it's Francovic going very wide on first time. Rouse the second. Brock is third. Johnson's up into fourth place. Then the BMW of uh, Trevor Crow is next. That's the leading group. Already, though, the Volvo is opening up a bit of a lead. Johnson comes around side on. It's a nose-to-tail procession. The field has thinned itself out fairly successfully. But look at the lead already that the Volvo is eking out. And in second spot, the Sierra is under a big challenge from Brock's Commodore. Well, a very sensible start from all those in the front rows of the grid. No madman tactics. Robbie Francovic getting away very, very cleanly initially. David Oxton getting away cleanly, but having been passed already by Brock. So Brock second into the corner. Francovic pulling away just a little. Oxton hanging in there behind Brock. Let them settle down as they come round onto the bridge approach for the first lap of 204. And it's Robbie Francovic who wants to make it two years in a row. Brock behind him, driving very sensibly, well within the limits of the car. Well, he's got a different race to last year. Last year he was last away this year first away and he crosses the line to lead on the first lap of the Nissan Mobile 500 here at Wellington. Well get times throughout the race for you and the gaps between the drivers as they get on. And Peter Brock getting a little wide at the exit to the hairpin bend there. Just getting the tail a little sliding. I think what Peter has decided is he can make up a little bit of ground on the Volvo in the corners and going hard early on to try and make sure that Prancevic doesn't get away from him. The turbo Volvo has the legs out of the corners in a straight line, enormous power very early on. So Peter Brock analyzing that is trying to go just a little hard around some of these slow corners to get, keep within range. And you can see there how he's closing up through the bends. Rouse in the Sierra trying to hang on, but not quite able to keep on the tail of the Commodore. And those three already are opening a bit of a gap over the rest of the field. Yes, just look at the spread this early on in a 204 lap race. Already quite a gap opening up between them. Have we got some problems there with... I think it's just braking. They yeah. were trying terribly hard, but I, did I see a torn rear bumper on car 10, the Armin Hane Ron Dixon Rover? Looked a bit like it. There's certainly some smoke coming from the back there. It's not, uh, not brake fire. Look at the cars into the pits already. That's the John Harvey Neil low Commodore. Right from the word go, this car was very slow off the grid. They lost something like seven positions by the time they got down to the, the first uh, corner, which was like Queen Street on a Friday night anyway. But um, there's Brock really starting to close in on Robbie Francovic now. And Alan Grace, the man that we haven't really heard a lot of so far this weekend. Up into fourth position, there's uh, Brock's car already bearing some battle scars with one of the uh, rubber strips on the rear bumper they're hanging down on the ground there david oxen still in third or andy rouse should i say in third position grice in fourth dick johnson in fifth tom walkenshaw a fair way down there but uh, the man that we haven't heard too much about is jim richards coming up through the field in the uh, in the volvo but one of the other jimmy keogh coming into the pits yes car 20 jimmy keogh and the glorious looking bmw only survived two laps and into the pits for a bit of attention there but the, in fact, the pit lane already is fairly crowded. We can see, what, three, four cars along the road there. But as we were thinking this morning, when we saw those first laps in warm-up with cars with full tanks for the first time, the two quickest were these two cars. Car 1, the Volvo 240T, the turbocharged four-cylinder Volvo, and Peter Brock in Car 5, the V8 Commodore. And that's the way it's proving in the race. They are pulling away from the rest of the field with full tanks for the, for the race. So the order after uh, these number of laps, Car 1 is leading. That's the uh, Robbie Francovic. Volvo. Oh, my heavens. We've got uh, some, some real signs of damage there from the Commodore of Graham Barkett, one of the uh, Auckland drivers. He'll be going into the pits. 
he's had a very heavy uh, meeting with someone or something. I suspect it looks like the Armco fence that he's put the nose of the car in, and that's going to cost him very dearly, and he'll be a, a very disappointed driver when he finally reaches the pit counter. Looking at that order after two laps, Robbie Francovic from Peter Brock in second place, Andy Rouse in third place, Alan Grice in fourth place, and Dick Johnson settling for fifth at the moment. But we don't imagine he'll be there for too terribly long. And already a couple of incidents with the Graham Falcon car having met a wall and in the pits for some repairs. Well, Andy Rouse has dropped back from the scraps and now it's a two-car race in these very early stages of this 204-lap race. But Brock is now right on the tail of Francovic, and I suspect he'll be happy to stay there for a little while just to see what Robbie does, to see how the car goes, how it handles. He'll try and squeeze by that Toyota, of course, which he does and gets right onto the tail of the Volvo. He'll just assess things for a while, and Peter Rock will make a decision if he thinks, OK, I can get in front of him without any trouble, without any danger. Peter likes to drive from the front, but he'll be happy just to see how things go for a while and put a little bit of pressure on the New Zealand driver. Mind you, I think Robbie could take it, don't you, Tony? I'm sure Robbie will love that. Certainly not a man who wilts under the pressure, but Peter Brock, at this stage of the race, certainly appears to have the measure of the Volvo. Brock able to close up that quickly in the race, sit on his tail. He's getting through the traffic just as quickly. If you notice, when Robbie Francovic gets past somebody, Peter Brock is sticking to his tail like glue. One car between them there. But Peter, Brock... he'll be unhappy with that, won't he? The chap obviously, and he let the man know. He said, please, watch the marshal. I suspect they weren't the words he was thinking of, but that was the message. What's happening, of course, is that these drivers in, in the smaller cars aren't expecting to be lapped in only four laps. And so they get a, one enormous shock when they see the first car loom up. And then by the time they've gathered their thoughts, there's Brock in their mirrors as well. So we're going to see a few problems, but Peter will be really upset with that driver because he could reasonably have expected to stay right on Franz Victor's tail and to have got a tow through the traffic. Instead, he had the traffic close on him, and now he's got to do it all over again. And if there is any advantage with the Volvo, it is getting out of corners where they slowed down the first corner very quickly, being able to get the acceleration, get the car moving quickly. And Peter Brock having to work very hard to get back in touch with Robbie Prancevic. He's not close enough to be in the tow at this stage, but he won't be long before he's back there again. I think Peter Brock has the measure of this Volvo, perhaps not enough to get past initially, but certainly he'll want to sit there on that tail for a little while. We were wondering what sort of lap times they might be doing. Well, our lap scorers tell us that they're going in under 1 minute 20. The times they're recording are about 119.6 in that area. So they are lapping very, very quickly. It's going to be a fierce pace. And I wonder how many of these cars and drivers can survive that sort of speed for so long. This is a long race. I think we can probably only expect that kind of pace for the first 20 laps or so. But that is a phenomenal pace to start with. Here's David Oxton coming through. And... Nick Johnson closing up on Alan Grice. Nick Johnson said he was going to go like hell right from the start. If that is the case, then he doesn't have the measure of the Commodore and the Volvo out front. He's been held up just a little by the traffic. Not enough to be completely out of touch. But after five laps, the race order is Robbie Prancevic, Peter Brock, Andy Rouse. Then we go back to Alan Grice and then Nick Johnson. That's the first five after five laps. And as we've said, a very, very hot pace early on in the race. One they can probably only maintain or hope to maintain for the first 20 or 25 laps. Then they're going to have to settle into a race pace that will last them 204 laps. It's fairly significant, I think, that Brock has got back on the tail of the Volvo again. You see there how he loses out under the sheer accelerative power of the turbo, but how he closes up under braking and when he corners. And that's in a race with so many corners and so much braking, I think that's a fairly significant factor. But the Volvo just squeezes away a little bit, then Brock comes shortening back again right on his tail, and he really is applying loads and loads of pressure to Francovic. I wonder also if Peter Brock has been surprised by the improvement in handling in this Volvo since last year, because having seen it on the track last year, he knew what the handling deficiencies were, and perhaps he didn't expect them to have improved by this much in the space of a year. Maybe not, although if he read his overseas newspapers, he would have seen that the Volvos were going very well towards the end of the year. And I think he'd be fairly well expecting this to be a very competitive car. After all, 
you don't win such a competitive series as the European Touring Car Championship against BMW, Ford, Rover and anything else they can throw against you unless the car handles well. And while it wasn't the best handling car, it had so much power and sufficient good handling to take out the championship. And it was very reliable. In the European Series of 14 races, the Volvo scored points in 12 of them. Now it won five. Tom Walkingshaw, who was runner-up, won seven. But he only finished in eight, which suggests that either Tom drives much harder than the Swedish driver or that maybe there is just a bit more reliability in the Volvo than we'll find in the Rovers, which are still back in the field, by the way, but gradually working their way through to a point where Walkingshaw and Hanna can exert some sort of challenge on these two leaders. So there's Robbie Prancevic, still in first place, with Peter Brock right on his tail, getting exactly the measure of that car. Alan Grice is trying to lap a slower car there. Am I mistaken? Did he just get by the Sierra? Let's have another look at that. It looks as though he's in front of uh, Andy Rouse. Yes, that's right. Rouse has dropped back. And in fact, it's Grice now who's moved up into third spot. And look at the pressure being put on Rouse by Dick Johnson. He's, for goodness me, if he opened the boot, he'd drive through. Dick Johnson really challenging Andy Rouse now. He'll have a look at the end of the straight, one imagines. No, he's not going to do it. But sitting very, very close and applying the pressure to Andy Rouse. He won't build under the pressure either. A very experienced driver. Rouse then back in fourth place. The cars now are lapping in 1 minute 20.15. That's the time of the fastest car, or the leading car. May not be the fastest car on the circuit. And Rouse, who had problems in practice this morning. At first, we thought it was uh, turbocharged failure, but it turned out to be the black box, a little electronic management system which failed in the car. So really, he's got to make sure that the rewired car is working well. And maybe Rouse is just content to squeeze it around and see how things go. And just looking up, in the pit road we have one retirement already the Balkan Wilkins and Holden Commodore being pushed unceremoniously back into pit road and not looking like a start at all no it needs a lot of plastic surgery I think it really hit the fence very hard and has damaged the front end apparently either too hard to continue or certainly too hard without a lot of extensive panel beating and mechanical work which is very bad luck for Balkan he was one of the favourites and he had done so well in earlier races this season I see they're having another look at it there, if people climbing underneath it, but I doubt that they're going to be back out and competitive. So Dick Johnson has got past Andy Rouse and now chasing Alan Grice. This is the charge that we expected to see from Dick Johnson right at the start of the race, but starting back on the grid a little ways, he's had to do the work and cope with the traffic to get through. Well, Rouse has dropped back then. He's now running in the fifth place. He was on pole position, so in a matter of only nine laps, he's dropped back from the lead to uh, trailing all the, uh, his, his main rivals in the race. And uh, I'm wondering whether the problem is to do with the uh, elec trouble, uh, electronic trouble rather he had this morning or whether it's just sheer pace. But certainly, whatever it is, he can't keep up with the pace of the Volvo in front, Rob's Commodore, and then uh, also Grice's Commodore, which is way up there now and in a position where he may start to close between the two leaders because he won't like sort of gap that's been opened up and then Johnson's Mustang. So the order at this stage, Francovic, Brock, Grice, Rouse, Johnson, Holm, Hane, Crow, O'Brien, McKinnon, Walkinshaw and Richards. So Tom Walkinshaw way back in 11th place at this stage. Well, while one rover has not improved because he started from 12th position, Armin Hane, the German who started behind him, he's up into 7th place. So one of the rovers is going very well. Peter Brock again putting his hand out the window to signify the lower order cars that he wants a clear road through. The Jaguar, number 11, the only one of the B12XAs in the race has just been pushed to the back of the pits, by the way, with a, an enormous amount of steam coming from the car. Well, there was a lot of smoke coming out the back of that in practice yesterday, so we didn't expect that it was uh, perhaps going to last all that long. Bad luck then for Alan Prince from Hutt, who uh, was in the car. They had troubles in practice, troubles in the race, but at least they might be able to have an early shower and watch the rest of it. The Rover. Now, Armin Hane has been going extremely well in car number 10. Had a poor practice yesterday, hit the fence, in fact. Uh, we had uh, Ron Dixon go out and do a few warm-up laps, hand over to the German champion, who then put it into the fence, and that was the end of practice, virtually, as far as they were concerned. But he's showing just how quickly he can go. And uh, in a car that is the, certainly the leading contender from Britain in uh, touring car races, and the sort of car that uh, will be carrying the hopes of the Austin Rover factory in Europe this year, a very quick car, 30 horsepower more, they say, than last year from a three and a half litre V8. Better aerodynamics, brakes a little better. And their forte, though, is not 
slow circuits like this where you have lots of slow corners where you need a lot of power and heavy braking where the rover shine is in sheer fast corners you see him just wagging his tail in impatience there and squeezing by one of the smaller cars he's got a lot of hard work not only passing cars that are in front of him legitimately but passes, passing cars that he had to uh, lap and they'll be doing this maybe 20 or 30 times during the race such is the difference in speed between cars and such is the length of the circuit it's only 2.64 kilometers around and these fast fellas are going so quickly that they'll be lapping cars many many times before they see the checkered flag well, race, race order after 10 laps First uh, is Carnival 1, of course, that's Robbie Francovic, Peter Brock in behind him, and then we go back to Carnival 16, Alan Grice from Australia, Dick Johnson in fourth, and the Sierra Turbo of Andy Rouse dropping back. Quite a bit of action down there in the pits at the moment. Charlie O'Brien is in there, and the, uh, the state coal BMW, also Bruce Anderson in the, uh, in the Falcon. He's had a coming together with the fence, and Jim Keogh is back in there again. Jim Clark in the Lancia Nitwear Escort is uh, having their continuation of problems. He was in for a few minutes and out again, and Charlie O'Brien has just left again. So the mechanics who thought their job was over and done with when the, uh, when the green light went on, we're certainly seeing a, an awful lot of overtime going on down there in the pits, and regrettably we're seeing some pretty badly damaged cars in there as well. I notice Peter Brock has dropped back just fractionally on Robbie Francovic. Not a lot in it at this stage. There's the gap. In some parts of the circuit, Brock can get closer than others. And in a straight line, Francovic seems to be able to run away. He certainly hasn't made any mistakes with the pressure being applied behind him from Peter Brock. Well, the rain hasn't fallen. In fact, it's a little sunnier now, but it is cool. And I think all the drivers will relish that because no one really likes a very hot race particularly the turbocharged cars drivers. They wouldn't uh, like that, not because of any extra discomfort as far as they're concerned, but the turbocharged engines themselves generate so much heat that on a hot day they would be at a disadvantage. Well, they've got almost perfect conditions, both for the cars and for the drivers. And Brock, I think, Tony, is driving a very sound tactical race. The only problem, when he runs into traffic and gets held up, I think he'd like to stay about that distance. Oh, here's a challenge, maybe. No, he decides to go behind Francovic again. Maybe just enough to show him that he could pass if he wanted to hoping to unsettle, to rattle the New Zealand driver. I don't think he'll do that. They're both old hands of the game, both in their 40s, both the men who know what it's all about. But still, you play the game, you need your rival as much as you can, and you try and let him know that you could pass him if, if but you only had the chance. Well, Brock had no, another slight hold up then with one of the slower cars, not nearly as much as before, and the fella couldn't do anything about it. They caught him at the worst part they could possibly have. Robbie Francovic having the pressure applied to him from behind by Peter Brock popping out every now and again and showing his full view to the rear vision mirrors of Robbie Francovic just to let him know he's still there closing up on some parts of the circuit but Robbie Francovic able to get away from him on other parts of the circuit and not looking like wilting under the pressure at all we know that the Volvos have been reliable there's no reason to suggest that it won't last 204 laps perhaps not at this hot pace but at a reasonable race pace. I wonder what Peter Brock has got going through his mind in terms of sitting behind Robbie Francovic. He must have seen by now that Robbie Francovic's not the sort of fellow that's likely to make mistakes. So Peter Brock sitting there, we imagine, and uh, waiting for the opportunity or for the time in the race when he decides it's a good idea to go and try and make a break. Obviously, what he'll be perhaps maybe trying to do is... Um to win the race at the slowest possible speed. He knows that he can stay in touch with Francovic. You know, he's proving that time and time again. But as to uh, probably let uh, Francovic be the um, be the hare at this stage of the game and, um, and set his own pace. Brock just sits in there and stays with him, preserving the car, preserving himself. It's a long, long way. As he said, it's a very demanding circuit, 2.64 kilometers. Uh, many gear changes and stabbing of the brakes per lap. But uh, he didn't earn the name Peter Perfect by being um, being rough on his cars that's for sure he's taking very very smooth lines picking and choosing where he's getting through some of the slower traffic not putting himself or the uh, beautifully prepared hdt commodore at risk but uh, it's taking nothing away from robbie france but what has surprised me is that alan grice dick johnson and co have, have lost contact with the leaders at such a very early stage um, they're obviously not doing it on purpose but i guess it's just showing us how quick the front runners are really going an interesting point about this, Brian. What's the way that Robbie Francovic is driving? If he has Brock close behind him and he approaches some cars, 
he, he only overtakes at the very last moment before the corner so that he makes sure that he sandwiches the following car between himself and Peter Brock. He's done it time and time again. It just shows you he's using his brain all the time. Racecraft, oh, a car has gone straight on there and almost took our leader out of the race. Almost a reverse T-bone. Yes, I think, uh, while some of the tail enders can be a bit of a problem to the fast drivers, they uh, they play it to their advantage to um, try and be uh, make things a little more inconvenient for the driver behind. But just see, there's Brock now. He's probably about um, 50 or 75 metres behind Francovic. But, you know, before too long, he'll be right up on the back of him. But, uh, the Volvo handling the conditions very, very well here. Francovic obviously enjoying himself out the top there. And uh, he'll be keeping his eyes on the mirrors there, just keeping an eye on Brock to see what's going on. Still in third position, Alan Grice from Australia and the second of the Sleepyhead Commodores. Of course, we saw the demise of the uh, the other Sleepyhead car, that driven by Aucklander Graham Balcott, who, of course, is the new New Zealand Touring Car Champion after an impeccable run during the International Series, only to have um, the Nissan Mobile 500 uh, just take him out so early in the piece. And, of course, him and Wayne Wilkinson were taken out of the Benson and Hedges Endurance Round of Pukakai with a fuel tank problem when they were lying way up with the leaders and there's Dick Johnson in fourth position behind Alan Grice Johnson closing up on Grice at this stage we'll just check the race order for you in the first few places now there is the order with Francovic leading from Brock and Grice and Johnson first four after 14 laps and those two at the front Brock and Francovic Francovic and Brock started to pull away just a little from Grice and Johnson. Johnson catching Grice certainly in fourth place and looking to take over that third. But they're well behind the front runners. We'll get a gap between the front two and the next two as they come round the next time past the start finish line. Robbie Francovic doing a superb job of driving through the traffic and giving Peter Brock as hard a road to drive as he possibly can. He's a wily old fox, is Robbie Brancevic, and he certainly knows all the tricks there are on a racetrack, as does Peter Brock. Well, the race order now, after 15 laps, Robbie Brancevic, car number one, car five, 05, should I say, Peter Brock in the HDT Commodore in second. Third is the Sleepyhead Commodore, driven by Alan Grice from Australia. Fourth is still Dick Johnson in the John Player Special Ford Mustang. And in fifth position, car number two, the Auckland Corner Bullion Commodore, driven by Denny Holm, being partnered again today by car owner Ray Smith. Now, there's only one second between Francovic and Brock as they come across the line, but the gap back to Alan Grice that we're looking at now is 14.9 seconds with Johnson right on his tail. So there is 14.9 seconds between Brock and third place. That's how much these two have cleared out from the rest of the field. And once again, Francovic has put traffic between himself and Brock. Which makes it hard for Brock, but Grice in the meantime enjoying a fairly clear run back there. He's pulled up a bit of a, a gap away from Dick Johnson and uh, the Sierra of, uh, of Andy Rouse seems to have disappeared. It's certainly dropped back a long way and seems to be falling further and further back. Maybe they're having some problem with their ignition, which... Uh, did happen in practice this morning it's coming through now as you can see it's still running in its place but dropping back and losing contact with the leaders as the race goes on yes just looking a few laps back as uh, Denny Holm was catching Andy Rouse uh, it didn't take him terribly long to get past and once he did he started to pull away quite comfortably so I wonder if Andy Rouse has settled into what he thinks the car will last at at race pace and hoping that that's going to be enough or if they in fact have a problem with the car because these turbos run so hot both the driver and the car get hot. And one of the things that you've got to bear in mind when you're pushing the car is just what that temperature gauge is saying. Yeah, my guess would be he has a problem with the car, that he's still he's, he's losing a bit of power. He was just so quick yesterday, and he's, uh, he's not driving to that form. He's a very fast driver. It's a good car. I'd say the ignition trouble is still with him, maybe in only small degree, and maybe he's decided to keep going that pace and see what happens to the leaders. But he is out of contention at the moment. He just can't keep up with the really quick cars at this stage of the race. There's Denny Hull, the Auckland Coil of Bullion Exchange Commodore, which they maintain is very little behind, if any, behind the specifications of the whole dealer team cars. And certainly, if anybody can put it on a good pace for the race, it will be Denny Hull. The sort of driver who, with the enormous experience that he has, 
can put a car in the same spot every lap, exactly the same lines, and turn in lap times, lap after lap, within 100. A little bit of an accident on the circuit. Yes, indeed. They're dragging some wheels away from the car that's put us up into the fence. You can just see it there. One of the small cars has gone in and uh, causing a lot of trouble for the marshals. You can see where uh, Chris, to Chris Toms in a uh, Ford Escort has gone into the barrier there, scattered the tyres and done no end of uh, damage to his car. And it's a very awkward part of the circuit. I'll have to move the car if they can, even if just put it against the fence. Denny Holm there, just right up behind Paul Adams in the little Corolla Sprinter. Bear in mind that Paul Adams in last year's race finished fifth overall. So while it's slower than the big grunters, it's a very competitive motor car that keeps going reliably. And Paul Adams, an excellent driver. And the order after 17 laps is Robbie Francovic, Peter Brock, Alan Grice, and Dick Johnson. That's it, the first four places after 17 laps. Interesting, too, uh, only that the time for Andy Rouse and Sierra is about 1.23. Still quick time, but uh, the, the leaders are circulating two to three seconds a lap faster than that. So that'll be a big margin by the time they've covered 100 laps or so. Andy Rouse and the dealer team Sierra Turbo in sixth position. Seventh, we have car number 10. That's Ron Dixon and Armin Hahn and the Rover Vitesse. Eighth is car number four. That's the Volvo 240T of Dave McMillan and Per Gunnar Anderson from Sweden. Ninth position is car number nine, the Tom Walkinshaw Win Percy. The second of the Rover Vitesses. Tenth is car number 31. That's the Trevor Crow Tony Long has BMW. Eleventh is car six, the Graham Crosby Lou McKinnon BMW. Just ahead of... Uh, the sister car, car number three, which is driven by John Morton and at the wheel at the moment, of course, the Australian touring car champion, Jim Richards, and in 13th position after having the car lock and low gear off the line, John Harvey co-driving with New Zealand and Neville Lowe in the second of the HDT Mobile Commodores. What we can tell you is that Alan Grice in third place has made up two seconds of the gap between Peter Brock and himself. Peter Brock and Robbie Francovic still running together, as you can see on the track there. And the gap back to third place, Alan Grice, he has closed by two seconds in the last three laps. So at that kind of pace of increase, only another four or five laps and he's going to be right on their tail. Another driver really going quickly is Armin Hane in uh, car 10, the Rover. We'll look at him in a while. I noticed his bonnet was bent. He's apparently hit someone in his uh, anxiety to get through the field, I suppose. Here comes Johnson, though, another man who's anxious to get up. I think Dick by now might be settling down to fourth place. Isn't what he doesn't want, of course, is to lose contact with Grice, who's up ahead in car 16. He's got a, a slower car between him. So Dick will be pressing as hard as he can. And by now, with the, the early excitement of these first 20 laps over, he'll be starting to plan out the tactics and say, OK, I know who's quick, I know whom I can pass, but I mustn't lose contact with Grice. He's as quick as anyone. He, Grice is probably the fastest driver on the circuit at the moment. He's catching the leaders. So Johnson knows if he can keep in touch with him, automatically he'll be dragged up into that battle between the Volvo and Commodore, which is heading this field. I think that's perhaps the reason why Dick Johnson has had a little trouble in the last couple of laps trying to stay in touch, is that Alan Grice has really picked up the pace. And Grice, as Evan has said, a very, very quick driver, a hard charger when he needs to, and he stayed out of trouble as he said he would early on in the race settled into that third place and now has the job ahead of him to catch Peter Brock in second place. There's Johnson coming through, not very far behind Price. This is Johnson in the black Mustang. Alongside a very similar Mustang with Bruce Anderson in it. But a lap down. It's not quite black and white, it's black and gold, but there's a difference in the way they're going, isn't there? The black one's certainly flying along with Johnson there in fourth place and in pursuit of the, the quick man on the circuit at the moment. I suspect also if we have a time on uh, the uh, the rover of Hane, we'll find he's going very fast as well as he'd made spectacular progress from 14th place to be up in the leading half dozen or in seventh place at the moment. So Hane knocking on the, the leaderboard, having made up seven positions in the first 20 laps. Peter Brock is right on Robbie Francovic's tail now. They've just gone past the start-finish line. The gap has been closed right up. Have a look at Brock there, right on the tail of Robbie Francovic. If he gets into traffic, it gets held up just a little. And we'll check again well, once as again, they come around the next time. Once again, Brock held up. He's waving his arm at the other driver, but I think it's Francovic. He is 
timing those passes so minutely that he gets in front of the car just before the corner and almost every time that Brock has been on his tail, Francovic has put a car between the two of them and Brock drops back and he has to do it all again. And in case you're sitting there in great sympathy with Peter Brock waving his arm out the window, we should perhaps uh, restate the fact that the onus is always with the overtaking driver. And we have to remember also that there's, this is a very narrow circuit in places and in some cases there's just nowhere for the driver to go. I think with Peter it's as much frustration as anything. He's had it happen so many times. He, uh, he's getting a little, bit, uh, a little bit hot about it. Here he goes again into another corner, into the bridge, and Francovic just got by that car. Now, Brock will have to follow him all the way through, and look at the lead that uh, the Volvo will have by the time they get onto the straight. Now that, he gained himself a good 80 metres by that manoeuvre, and now Brock has to do it again, and he doesn't like it. And part of the, the blame, perhaps, rather than the blame that Peter Brock is putting on the slower drivers, who don't have a lot of place to go, he should perhaps be looking at Robbie Francovic, who's causing the situation deliberately so that uh, Peter Brock has to drop back a little. The well, gap between Brock and Alan Grice in third place stayed the same on the last two laps, still 13 odd seconds. Well, Grice is trying very hard. I was watching him hanging the tail around the corner, but as you can see, Brock is closing, but Grice is trying desperately hard behind him, sliding much more than Brock's car in the red Commodore. Here he comes. He won't do any sliding around here, but coming in out off the bridge, he was almost at 90 degrees to the direction of travel. And no one, no one slides all four wheels better than Alan Grice. He really does grab a car by the scruff of the neck and throw it around the circuit. The first man ever to lap the infamous Mount Panorama circuit at Bathurst at more than 100 miles an hour, that's Alan Grice, so he's a, a very quick sprinter. He can really pump up the adrenaline for one super fast lap, but he also has the ability to keep on going just as fast for quite a few. There's probably no quicker driver in Australia when it comes to doing a number of very, very rapid laps, but he doesn't have the same finishing record as, as Peter Brock. I suspect partly because of the, the, the hard way he drives and also because he hasn't always had the same level of machinery. And Dick Johnson, I think, is back this closing up. Dick is going very hard as well. You've got probably two of the hardest drivers in touring cars, almost nose to tail. There's Dick Johnson who has made up ground on Alan Grush, no doubt. Alan Grice on that last lap was slowed just a little by some of the traffic in front of him and the gap has dropped to 15.3 seconds from 13 so a lot of his hard work went awry on that last lap. Here comes Grice and here comes in black shadow Dick Johnson. One car to pass, it'll be difficult for Dick Johnson to be right on his tail but luckily he's far enough back to come through without hold up and he'll pass it on the straight. So still in pursuit of Alan Grice. A great tussle between these long-term rivals. One of the Rovers, by the way, just going past us now. Hane slowed right down as he came off the bridge. Almost, in fact, looked as though he was about to go into the pits, but went on. He looked like he had a bump, certainly at the front. We noticed that before. So Hane, in trouble in car 10, has worked his way up. There he is. He's worked his way up from 14th on the grid to 7th on the road. He has a damaged rear end. And the front is also bearing the marks of a bump that he got earlier in the race. So he's forcing his way through the field and has got just a, a bump in the tail recently. Here's the front of the car, the bonnet up a little bit on the right-hand side. You can't see it very clearly here, but it certainly is squeezed up, but the back is damaged. Have a look. Not the way it came out of the factory, not too severe, but he has been nudged by someone behind him, and there are a few contenders following him might well have done that sort of damage. Peter Brock still sitting on the tail of Robbie Francovic and the gap back to third, still 15 seconds for Alan Grice. Well, and you can see the boomerang rear end of Armin Hane's Rover Vitesse. He's still going quickly. He had a momentary slow down when he got hit coming off the bridge and just uh, took some time to settle things back again. Almost stopped and then got it going again. So he lost quite a lot of time. He's in fact moved up now to sixth place, Hane. So it's an amazing climb through the field. He has passed eight cars. He's still Francovic in the Volvo, of course, in front from, uh, from Brock in the Commodore. Alan Grice is next in the Commodore from Johnson in the Mustang. Then it's uh, the old wise man of the race, Denny Hall, up in the fifth place in Commodore number two. And Honey in the Rover, way up to sixth place. And what could be in some ways the driver of the race, certainly a very forceful drive. But the wise drive, the fast drive, has been won by Francovic, up there in front. So let's have a look at the positions after 22 laps. 
After lap 24, in fact, Francovic from Brock, from Grice, from Johnson. No change in that order. Just looking down there on the circuit at the moment from uh, from our commentary position is that the Andy Rouse Ford Sierra Turbo is going to be lapped fairly shortly by the race leader, Robbie Francovic. Peter Brock tucked in behind him. Certainly a very high attrition rate down on the pitch. There's three or four cars been in there. Jim Keogh's just been in and out again. Jim Clark's down there in the RS 1600 Escort. This is his second visit to the pits, and uh, we've had a couple of the little Toyotas in there. So um, it very much is a race of attrition. We started with some 38 or 39 competitors. Uh, we've seen the Graham Balcott Commodore go. The Jaguar has gone. Uh, John Harvey was in a problem here with the car locked in low gear on the opening lap. Certainly not a nice sort of a position to be in with... Uh, an enormous field behind you uh, with the, the thing locked in low gear. It's certainly a rather unnerving experience. And of course, he lost a lot of time getting around the circuit back to the pits again. The problem was fixed very quickly, but there's the Sierra into the fence. Andy Rouse has belted the, uh, in fact, it's lost a wheel. The left front wheel has gone on the Sierra Turbo. This is the car that's at pole position in the hands of the British Saloon Car Champion. It's almost a disaster for him too, Brian, because it happened just a few, few metres past the entrance of the pits. Had it happened a bit earlier, he'd have gone straight into the pits. Now he's boiling. He's out of the race. Up goes the flag to obscure the view. But look, you can see, that's the end of the race for, for Rouse. And what drama. Had it happened a little earlier, he could have gone straight into the pits and sought some sort of relief. He attempted to... Oh, you can see the wheels off. He attempted to drive around. Uh, no way in the world he can do it. And the car has come to a grinding halt on the main straight, up against some of the herbage there. And in fact, the greatest threat he's posing at the moment is to set fire to Wellington. What a great shame it is for the... Uh for the Ford dealer team. This is the car which Andy Rouse won last year's British Saloon Car Championship in. And he's sharing it with David Oxen, or was sharing it with David Oxen, who uh, at the moment is in the pits all dressed up and nowhere to go. Let's just have a look at the incident again. Now, I wonder if the tyre was deflated. The car certainly looked to be sagging on that side before he hit the wall. Well, the first thing we saw showed a loose wheel, so it happened before he went into the fence. So, Ralph didn't lose the wheel through hitting the fence. The wheel was loose, was broken off. You can see it there, it's not just a puncture, although it's, uh, it's still out there in the middle of the track, and none of the marshals are going to do anything about it for a while. But there's the wheel. Ralph's wheel has rolled to the middle of the track. It's a bit mangled from that contact with the, with the fence. And he might well be singing the song, if I picked a fine time to leave me loose wheel. Well, I thought the marshals might have been a little bit more uh, on the job to get this wheel out. Um, you know, that's uh, that's just crazy leaving that there. But I guess it's access and uh, with the cars coming around onto the straight and the wheel being in such a precarious position. But um, everybody's done a lap. The wheel's being removed now, but everybody's done a lap. So they're obviously aware of it. But it's certainly uh, an obstacle that they can well do without. And talking of obstacles, Brock is passed. Brock saw his chance on the straight. He was very close. He'd been right on the tail of Francovic. He got by... He's holding on to his leader now, Brock, for the first time in the race, having covered about 27 laps, is in front. So Peter Brock, at lap 27, takes the lead of the 500-kilometre race here at uh, Wellington. So what's Francis going to do about it now? Is he going to try and get by? Is he going to be prepared to sit behind? Or will Brock, with a clear road at last, start to draw away? Let's just have a look at how he did it again. This was... Uh Actually, Robbie Francovic getting the same problem as he's put on Peter Brock on so many laps, getting held up by the other Holden dealer team car with John Harvey in it. And there was Brock hopping out of the slipstream and getting past, diving down under brakes, breaking later than Robbie Francovic, and passed. Well, that was a fine passing manoeuvre caused by the fact that Francovic had to brake more heavily than expected, lost a bit of momentum. Brock saw the chance, went straight by, and now he's on the, the lead of the race, so we have a new race leader, Peter Brock. Now, Robbie Francovic has dropped back just a little. The initial reason why Brock was able to get past was because Francovic was slowed by the car. Now coming into the pits, by the way. John Harvey bringing car seven into the pits for the second time. And I wondered if it might have been a little bit of team tactics, but it seems that John Harvey had a genuine problem. I think so, and I don't think he would have seen the situation quickly enough to have done that. It, besides which, it's not the way John Harvey drives. He had a problem with the left rear tyre of the car, but 
changing all the tyres at the moment, putting fuel in, and Neil Lowe will get in the car. Just wonder how far ahead now Peter Brock can get of Robbie Prancevic. I wondered when he was sitting behind Prancevic for so long if he might have been thinking that a pit stop quicker than Prancevic's would have put him in front. But obviously he had the measure of the Volvo, knew how quickly it could go, took his opportunity when it was there, and now leads the race. Another look back for Prancevic. Rather unusual that uh, John Harvey should start the race, and then with just some 27, 28 laps gone, hand over to, uh, to Neil Lowe. The uh, pit stop has just been completed. It might be, Brian, that they're not reckoning they're going to go much further. Because the second time in the pitch, he might say to me, well, you know, and there's Dick Johnson in the pitch with a, a tyre change as well. So we're getting much earlier stops among some of the leaders than we might have expected. They're changing all the rubber. They're having trouble with the front wheel. It's, it's not the tyres that he came in because the bonnet is up. They're changing the tyres while he's there, calling his brother, who's a mechanic for him, over to let him know what the problem is. Well, you can see the frustration and the anguish on the face of Dick Johnson. Led last year's race till he had brake troubles. It's hot out there. Yeah, a little bit of sustagen. Let's see if we can get a word with him. He's obviously uh, feeling the heat out there a little. Might not be an appropriate time to get a word with Dick Johnson. Doesn't look terribly happy at the moment. He's obviously going to stay in the car. He hopes to get back in the race. He doesn't think it's a major problem. But bad luck for the Queenslander once again at the Nissan Mobile 500 Wellington Road Race as Peter Brock runs away with this lead now, having opened up quite a gap and put some traffic between himself and Robbie Pransovy. It's going to be intriguing to see how quickly the Holton dealer team can do their pit stops. Can you imagine the feelings of Alan Moffat in the pits? You know, it, he must be feeling rather a glow of contentment, saying, well, Peter's in front, the car seems to be all right. A few of our rivals are in trouble, particularly Dick Johnston, the big black Ford Mustang. And when Peter comes in to hand over the car to me, I'll have a pretty good drive. Alan Moffat certainly capable of making the car lap as quickly as Peter Brock. And one imagines they'll have sorted out what a consistent lap time should be now for the rest of the race. Great battles going on down the field, particularly one between Charlie O'Brien here and Graham Crosby. One of the Rovers in the pits as well, by the way, as we watch Brock having an awkward uh, time around the corner with heavy traffic. Brock still threading his way through traffic, and I would think that passing some of these slow cars on this narrow track would be the highlight of the race that these drivers are going to remember afterwards. The fact that it was a constant problem for them, getting by fellows engaged in their own desperate drives, these two BMWs in front, for instance. Charlie O'Brien and Graham Crosby in the two BMWs there, about to be lapped by Peter Brock, and they're hardly people you would have thought would have been lapped. Certainly they looked in practice to be competitive, but just an indication of how hot this pace is early on in the race. Perhaps they're slowing each other down, dicey. Graham Crosby and Charlie O'Brien have had some very good dices in the earlier sprint races in the Group A series. Peter Brock coming round on them so quickly. It's about the first of the rapid cars that Brock had to pass too in terms of lapping. Two, uh, two quick drivers, Charlie O'Brien and uh, Graham Crosby, and two big cars. And look at the bunch of traffic in front. It's like Friday afternoon outside the shops. Uh, Peter Brock trying to get Graham Crosby out of his way. Graham Crosby getting Charlie O'Brien out of his way and Charlie O'Brien getting in his way. So there we are. There's lots and lots of traffic. It indicates, I think, Tony, just how much the BMWs have sort of dropped back a little bit without the development some of the other cars have had in the last year or so. But they're not that much slower that Peter Brock can come up on them and pass them at will. Obviously, the BMWs are competitive cars in the sense that they can get going in a straight line quickly enough to make it a difficult job for Brock to get past it. He gets past O'Brien now. There's Dick Johnson waiting to come out. The marshal, of course, slowing him until it was safe to go. Dick spent about four laps in the pit, so he's lost a lot of ground. 
and very anxious to get going. It seemed that they were doing something to the wheel bearing at the front. It was in that area where the problem was. He took the opportunity to change tyres, stayed in the car. He was hot, wanted to keep on going before handling over to Neville Crichton. And there's uh, a lot of traffic there. That's uh, the second of the the two cars. We're low on board now, having replaced Harvey in the second of the mile for Holden dealer team cars behind the Rover, which is trying desperately to, to get by on the bridge. There really are some frustrating parts of this circuit where if the drivers get behind slow cars, they just can do nothing about it except hang on. And there are two quick cars there devouring some of the smaller cars. And as we said about uh, Brock and Moffat, there's nothing between them and lap times. The same applies to Neil Lowe and John Harvey in the number two, the number seven car there in your picture, old dealer team car. Neil Lowe capable of the same lap times as John Harvey. He felt this morning that he was a little inexperienced in this car in particular to be absolutely sharp if it came to a hard charging run. But he's quite confident that he can go out there and lap in good, consistent race times. Walking short in the car in front with the headlights on the rover there. Walking Shore, who had a, a rather miserable practice yesterday with electric troubles. They had their only clear run when they weren't trying to go hard before the rain fell and then they had their electrical troubles and that's it they started from back in 12th place on the grid and he's just uh, marginally faster i suppose than low although there's really nothing much in it which sort of indicates the uh, the the performance of these two cars one slightly smaller v8 three and a half liter versus a 4.9 liter the rover more high revving probably more suited to a really high speed circuit they love the very fast corners that's the way the car's been developed even the aerodynamics are designed to work better at very high speed. So Walkinshaw will be doing it the hard way, but that's the way he likes to operate. He's a very tough fellow, Tom Walkinshaw. He's built like a Scottish farmer, big broad shoulders, has a nice thick accent, a nice sense of humour, has a reputation for being a very hard man and not, not the sort of man you should approach during a race. But I must say the experience we've had here this time, Tony, has been that Walkinshaw has been all charm. I think most of what is said about him applies to him on the track. I've always found him very affable when he's off the track, but certainly I wouldn't want to try and mix it with him on the track. And some of what we've seen of him in previous years. Tom Walkinshaw, very, very determined driver and very aggressive in his style. He wasn't happy at all about being punted off the track last year. Now following around Dick Johnson in the Mustang, who's back out but several laps down. That's Ron Dixon, Armin Hane in the pits. Now they were rammed in the back. We did see their damaged bumper and maybe have done some damage to their fuel system. You see them working on the tanks. Just trying to hear what they're saying in there. A lot of it is not repeatable. But they've obviously damaged the fueling system in that thing in the back. Yes, they're working on the pillar on one side. When they had the bump, it looked like it pushed it forward. And they've probably either developed a leak or else it squeezed up the pillar. Alan Hunter, the German driver. You can see the frustration. Not saying much. It's pretty dear for us. It's no idea driving these cars. Not a tear of frustration, just perspiration. But take the chance to dry up a little bit. It's hard work out there, and a German particularly or someone from the Northern Hemisphere would find things very hot here today, having come straight from a European winter. OK, let's have a look at this stage of the race, at the race order. Coming up in just a moment. Peter Brock in the lead, of course. And here is the race order. After 34 laps, Brack, Brock from Francovic, from Grice, from Denny Holm. Denny Holm closing a little on Grice, and Grice still closing on Robbie Francovic in second place. And we'll get another measure of that gap for you. It was about 14 seconds a lap ago. I'll check it again the next time round. But Peter Brock in the lead, having taken the lead on lap 27, and starting to pull away a little from Robbie Francovic. Well, let's start looking at people who are doing well in this race, maybe not spectacularly. Denny Holm is one. He's up there in fourth place, not doing anything wrong, not making any mistakes, not driving with quite the same pace as the leaders, which maybe means the car is a little more inclined to last. So put Denny Holm down as one driver who might do very, very well in this race. Not that he's doing badly at the moment. He's up there in fourth place, and that's a great result. Neil Lowe just leading his team leader, Peter Brock, on the road at the moment. He's taken over in the second of the Holden dealer team cars, but... Brock is very quickly catching him, and Lowe quite dutifully pulls over to the side and gives Brock a perfect passage through the hairpin bend and gets a nice little wave, a friendly wave this time, in response. There 
was eight seconds between Peter Brock in first place and Robbie Brancevic in second. And going back to third place, another 19 seconds back to Alan Grice in third place. So 27 seconds between first and third, eight seconds between first and second. Robbie Brancevic dropping back just a little as the race has gone on. And after Peter Brock got past him on lap 27, he started to drop back really quite quickly indeed. The two Holden dealer team cars now lapping together. But Neil Lowe, a good lap down on Peter Brock. Now the theories will start to emerge now as to whether or not Neil Lowe is helping Peter Brock with the two Holden dealer team cars running together on the track. And one imagines it's harder to get past two of them than one of them if Neil Lowe can stay on a similar sort of pace. There doesn't appear to be a great deal between them in terms of performance at this stage because Peter Brock has settled into what he thinks will be a race pace after that very early, very hot pace. So Neil Lowe just following around behind Peter Brock, but well down in the race order. And there is the gap back to second place, Robbie Prancevic, eight and a quarter seconds behind Peter Brock, and a further 19 seconds back to Alan Grice in third place. He was within 12 seconds at best, but has dropped back now quite considerably. So either Alan Grice has decided that the car won't last at the pace he was driving it at, or has been balked so much by slower traffic that it's cost him that distance. And I think uh, down on the pits, we might be able to get a word with the man who has had incredibly bad luck, Andy Rouse. He set pole position yesterday, and after 20 odd laps, he had something come unstuck with the car. Let's find out what it was that caused him to hit the wall. Well, Andy Rouse all the way from the UK. A few rather scintillating laps than that. Now, what caused the car to hit the wall? Unfortunately, the front suspension broke. And the, uh, the wheel broke and went underneath the car. It, caught into a, it happened just coming off the bridge there, and I hit the wall on the, on the left-hand side. According to an eyewitness report, the wheel broke went underneath the car and we just got the wheel back and it's a it's a breakage of the suspension strut so we learned something today just metal fatigue or something like that or do you think it's something you clipped around the track no without without looking at it and studying it in depth it's difficult to tell i, I hadn't bumped anything up to that point not in practice or in, in the race so i don't know you look like you're going to try to make it back to the pits even though it was going to be a fairly uh lengthy no brakes I'd only got rear brakes when I was coming down there, so I was going to try and get in the pits, but I got no steering, no brakes, so I thought, well, I'll put it in a safe place and cross over. We saw you cross over the track there. That must have been a bit hazardous in itself. Well, it took a while just to gather my thoughts before I got out of the car. <laughs> Andy Rouse, a disappointed man, having set pole position and having to go out that early in the race. A broken suspension arm has cost them any chance of winning the Nissan Mobile 500. Bad luck for him and the co-driver David Oxton, who didn't even get to drive in the race at all. Hopefully we'll be able to coax David Oxton up to the commentary box a little later on to explain a few uh, technicalities to us. But he'll be disappointed, having not even sat in the car during the race. Here's the race leader, Peter Brock, still continuing at very, very consistent lap times. And managing to hold on to that lead of the race, which... He seemed to have the measure of the Volvo Turbo fairly early on and sat behind it for a while. He's there busily signalling the slower drivers where he wants them to be on the circuit when he passes them. Pretty good at giving directions, Peter Brock, as well he might, considering the difference in performance between his car and some of the slower ones and how quickly the front runners were able to lap some of the back markers. Sure, Alan Moffat will be sitting in the pits thinking, what a nice place to get in the car. I think they could even afford a little bit of a mishap at the pit stop. Not that it's likely with the Holden Dealer Team pits crew. And speaking of Holden Dealer Team, John Harvey has just got out of the car, handed over to Neil Lowe. Let's see if we can get a word with him. What happened to you, John? Well, first of all, uh, right at the start, the car jammed in first gear, so I had to do a complete lap in first gear to get back here to get it disengaged, so I'd lost probably two laps or something like that. 
Uh, I went back out and I was quite happy with the times. In fact, uh, probably going a little bit faster than Peter in the early going. But uh, then uh, towards the end, I passed David Oxton, or I think it was Andy Rouse in the car. I just checked him in the mirror as I'd gone past and I saw the wheel come off and he crashed into the wall or something. So one lap later I come round there, there, there may have been a warning flag out but I certainly didn't see it because you're pretty busy there and the damn wheel's still sitting in the middle of the track. And I tried to avoid it, just clipped it and uh, flattened the tyre so I had to do another slow lap uh, to get back here. So I was just a little bit annoyed with myself with, for hitting it with the problems I'd had when the car was going so well. And so I just decided to give it away for a little while, let uh, Neil get out there and have a go, and I'll just settle down and get back in later on. Well, I've seen you win a race at Doran Park where you abandoned the car on one side of the track, ran to the pits, got back and still won. Can you and Neil still do it from here? Well, I think so, yeah. There's a, there's a chance, a remote chance that we, we could do that, but I'd certainly like to finish the race. I feel OK now, so uh, Neil's out there doing a great job, and I'll get back in about lap uh, 90 or something, I think. When are we likely to see Peter Brock in the pits? Around about lap 73, I think. No problems with that car? No, it's running perfect. John Harvey, the driver of the number two Holden dealer team car with Neil Lowe. This car here, he just got out. Neil Lowe's out there doing consistent lap times and keeping the Holden dealer team flag to the forefront with Peter Brock in the other car in the lead of the race. And as you heard from John Harvey, around about lap 73 or 4, we'll see Peter Brock in the pits. And one imagines that the Holden dealer team, being as proficient as they are, will make it a very quick pit stop and lose them no time. Peter Brock still signalling to other drivers where he wants them to be to let him pass. Seems to be taking his hands off the wheel quite a lot, just as well he's got the window wound down. And it seemed, Brian Lawrence, that Peter Brock, once he got past Robbie Francovic, had obviously been sitting there sizing him up and was able to run away quite quickly. Yeah, he obviously had the measure of Robbie there in the opening stages. I think he was just establishing the fact that he could run around at that particular pace and stay in touch uh, with the, the Volvo. And then once he got his, his race pattern sorted out once, I mean, that would have been sorted out before they really got the, um, the race underway, but the actual circuit pattern as to what was going to be going on, um, perhaps familiarising himself with, um, you know, the slow cars, who to watch out for and exactly what was going on. And then um, in the typical Brock professional manner, he just got on with the job, and I think that when he when he passed him, he had him all lined up. He knew exactly where he was going, and um, and he did it with ease. It's interesting to note that um, Jim Richards now, who started in around about 18th position at the beginning of the race, which was a little over an hour ago, um, he's now up into the top 10, driving very very smoothly as always. But I would have thought that uh, perhaps the BMW would have been a little more competitive, particularly in the hands of Jim Richards. He tailed. Graham Crosby for oh, well over 20 laps before he did anything about it. But, uh, this is the second place car. This is the Robbie Francovic, Thomas Lindstrom, Volvo 240T, owned of course by Mark Petch, a man who's poured a tremendous amount of money into motor racing over the last 12 months. It all really began about this time last year, and uh, this car's done an enormous amount of miles. I mean, it uh, perhaps does deserve the title of Swedish Taxi in terms of mileage. Brian, I've uh, just discovered the reason why the Volvos, are, the uh, BMWs, are perhaps not as competitive as we had expected. Peter Brock has just turned in two lap times at 1.19.4. Incredibly hot pace for this late of the race. We expected that they would run the race at around 22.23. That is one minute and 22 or three seconds. But Peter Brock obviously putting in some quick ones, getting a break on the field if he can and uh, trying to get away with that little break before his pit stop comes up. But capable of uh, 1.18.5 as we saw yesterday in the dry in the Holden Commodore and in a race at this stage of it, doing a lap of 1.19.4 is very, very hot pace indeed for Robbie Francovic to try and keep up with. It is very quick. You know, John Harvey was obviously very happy with the time that he was wheeling in there because he was in the very low 20s. So, you know, um, the car's identically prepared, and Harvey's uh, certainly while he runs the number two car, you know, he's certainly a driver that uh, is um, very, very capable of winning a long distance race like this. This is Jim Richards in the uh, T McMillan Metro BMW, just ahead of the car that's lying second on the road, Robbie Francovic. And just in front of uh, Richards, got one of these smaller capacity cars sitting in the middle of the road being the meat in the sandwich so to speak 
and Francovic uses this to his advantage and takes Richards at the same time. And of course, when we go back to last year's Australian Touring Car Championship, um, Jim Richards must be feeling a little bit uncomfortable in that car because uh, he was dealing to, uh, to Francovic and almost everybody else in Australia last year, dictating the terms everywhere he went around every circuit in Australia. And here he is now being let by the guy that he was um, literally rubbing door handles with all of last year. Jim Richards, uh, as you know, well familiar with the BMW, having won the Australian Touring Car Championship in a similar car for 1985. And a very, very talented driver, probably in purest terms, one of the best single-seater, uh, sorry, one of the best saloon peddlers that this country has ever produced. Whatever it is, wherever he's lying on the road, you know, he'll be enjoying himself. He's a guy that just loves racing cars and a very quiet, unassuming sort of a person. Um, certainly one of the most respected sportsmen in Australasia, I would think, a, a definite professional attitude to his motor racing. And um, for his outside interests, he spends a lot of time either with his family or um, on two wheels. Alan Grice is in the pits. Looks like a scheduled stop, changing the tires. So Alan Grice uh, is gonna have to leave that challenge a little later that's a fairly easy pit stop jimmy richards still tooling around in the bmw a little off the pace at this stage as you can see alan grice has had a little bit of a coming together with some hard surface somewhere but back out and on it While we were looking just a little while ago at Jimmy Richards at the BMW, another man who's been in the pits rather more than he would have liked is Jimmy Keogh in a BMW 635 CSI. Let's get a word with him and see what the problems have been. Well, Jim Keogh, you're carrying the colours of Television New Zealand, and in television terms, you're off the air. What's the problem? We better apologise to Television New Zealand for that burst, Evan. We popped a fan belt in the first lap and the engine boiled. It looks like it's cooked the head gasket because it continues to go off the clock when we refill it with water. So, uh, unfortunately for today, that's the end of our race, but at least we're going to end up with a fresh race car for next weekend. It's amazing how tiny things can cause these problems. How do you put up with the frustrations of motor racing? Well, if you ask me tomorrow, I might be a little more resilient, but right now I'm not putting up with it very well. <laughs> well, you know that what they say about motor racing, the way to make a small fortune for motor racing is to start with a big one, Jim Keogh. Thanks, Evan. Jimmy Keogh running the Television New Zealand colours on his car and as Evan Green said in television terms he's off the air at this stage having had to retire rather unfortunate for him and the news at the moment is that with Alan Grice having made his pit stop Denny Holm is in third place and he's only 11 seconds behind second place Robbie Francovic and closing he's made up two seconds in the last four laps we'll catch that gap again the next time they come around that's the gap between second and third place with Peter Brock well out in front. So the order at this stage, Brock from Francovic, from Denny Holm. And in fourth place, we've got an amazing performance from the Dave McMillan, Per Gunnar Anderson Volvo Turbo. He's pulled himself up to fourth place. Uh, we just heard from the pits that we may have a pit stop from Robbie Francovic. That's Thomas Lindstrom ready to get in the car. So Robbie Francovic coming in. We gather the problem is tyres. And that wouldn't surprise me. Because the Volvo Turbo has always been very hard on tyres. They're running Pirellis today. There's nothing that's deficient with the tyres. It's just that this car in the class that it's running has to run comparatively narrow tyres and with the enormous horsepower that it has it gets through tyres fairly quickly but bear in mind they were in the pit six times last year and still won the race 204 laps is a long way we'll get a look in just a moment if we can after we've seen Robbie Francovic's pit stop we gather they're coming in this time around no, Francovic has opted not to pit this time round he's going to do at least another one We'll see if we can get a look back at the 
per Gunnar Anderson and Dave McMillan entry of the Volvo 240T, similar to this one of Robbie Francovic's. Try and check the gap again as Robbie Francovic comes round, losing time because of the tyres having gone off. Try to go past Trevor Crow. Not that time, but being slowed up even more now by a slower car, having to get off the gas. Pass Trevor Crow that time, Francovic. Let's have a look and see if he does pit this time round. Certainly Thomas Lindstrom is ready and waiting in the pits. The gap between Peter Brock and Robbie Francovic. As we look at it now, Peter Brock having just gone past the start-finish line. Here's Francovic. If he pits this time, we can't give you the gap because it's irrelevant. If he stays out, we'll be able to tell you how much he's losing. Francovic is staying out. And the gap between Peter Brock and Robbie Francovic is 21.5 seconds. So he's definitely losing time at around about a second a lap. And he must, he really must be at the stage now where he's got to wonder if staying out there is worthwhile. Making the pit stop might cost him time, but it'll give him new tyres. Let's go down to the pits and... Uh, in fact, we were trying to get a word with Mark Petch, the team manager for Robbie Francovic, Thomas Lindstrom entry. But uh, they're a little tense and they're getting ready for the stop the next time around, so he doesn't want to talk to us right now. Those of you who were waiting to see the softball on the television, I'm afraid you're out of luck today. The rain in Auckland has meant that the softball has been cancelled, called off for the day. So we'll be staying with the motor racing. Danny Holm continues his chase, Tony. He's only 9.6 seconds now behind Robbie Francovic, who's coming into your picture now. In behind him is uh, the Tony Longhurst Trevor Crow Archibald BMW. This is the uh, ex Neville Crichton car from last year. This is Francovic. And Denny Holm, by that time, has caught up two seconds in the last two laps. Francovic staying out there again. Uh, Robbie Francovic's crew sitting there waiting anxiously, but Robbie Francovic has opted not to come in this time. They're all there and ready and waiting. Gap between first and second at this stage, 21.7. And the gap between second and third, 10.5. And the gap between third and fourth, 53 seconds. So a big gap between the front runners. As this race settles down to what will be race pace for them, bearing in mind it's 204 laps long. Here's Francovic round again. I wonder how long Robbie Francovic is going to stay out there because the tyres are obviously costing him. But he knows that the pit stop has to be made at the right time. Let's look and see if Francovic goes past the pits again this time. He's onto the bridge. We'll be able to see from his exit off the bridge whether or not he's going to pit. He's coming in this time. We'll just put a clock on their pit stop. See how long it takes them. It'll take the time from when he stops rolling until when he leaves the pits. Of course, it's longer than that because he's still got to wait for a marshal to let him out of the pits and back onto the track proper again. Changing all four tyres. 12 seconds gone now. Big air gun on the single nut holding the wheel on. When the man is finished and ready to go, the fuel is full. Those little air rams come out and just plug an air gun into the car. That's a 35.7 second pit stop. So he's probably lost 40 seconds by the time he gets back out of the track again. Not having to wait for very long. 
35 seconds. He's only dropped one place. He's still down there in, um, in second position. Sorry, third position. Denny Holm has gone through. Alan Grice is still holding on to his fourth. And he's coming up now in uh, interview. Another cars coming in and out of the pits here at this stage of the game. There's another one of the Rovers on their way in. Just leaving the pits now is the Jim Keogh BMW. They've obviously put some more water in to give it another go. And uh, in the pits now, the Tom Walkinshaw Rover. Up go the Air Jackson, a very experienced crew, right on the job, changing those wheels just so fast. Of course, with these Group A cars, you don't have to put a jack underneath and jack it up. They have four little air rams underneath the car. They just plug in a compressed air hose and the car raises itself and when the hose is pulled out, the car drops down again. Wynn Percy now taking over the, the wheel of the Whitaker's Rover Vitesse. These are the cars that took on the Volvos in last year's European Touring Car Championship but had to concede defeat to the Swedish mark. A little bit of last minute instructions from Tom Walkinshaw to win Percy and I wonder if there's a problem with the car. They obviously want something checked. It's a very long pit stop wasn't it? Um, they had the wheels changed and Percy was in the car very quickly but uh, Walkinshaw looking at the gauges on the dash. Yes they've been in for a good 50 seconds now. Let's go back to the race leader, Peter Brock, having taken the lead on lap 27 of the Nissan Mobile 500 and led ever since and is cruising away and extending that lead. And while Peter Brock wanders away, still with many laps to go before his first pit stop, let's have a look at the highlights of the first hour of the Nissan Mobile 500. They're away. Bear in mind, the turbos are not supposed to be... The, the race is coming up to around 90 minutes old. It's going to be 204 laps. Brock wheels himself out of the hairpin. There's Francovic, full tank of gas, fresh set of tyres. Let's go down to the pit road and see if we can get a word with the man who's just got out of this car, Robbie Francovic. Robbie, we saw you come in a minute ago. We gather the problem was tyres going off on you. No, no, that was our scheduled stop. We were going to always run a short stop for the first one. And then Thomas will do a maximum run. And whatever's left, I'll run through to the frag. When Brock got past you back there, was uh, did you let him past, or was there nothing where you could really do about it? Yeah, it's always good leading, because it's a bit easy. You can get traffic in between you. But I got badly balked, and he um, got a better run onto the straight, so he passed me, and I... Um, so rather than chase them, it's better to look after the car. How's the car running, Robbie? Beautiful. And you're still hopeful that uh, it might do and pull off the hat trick and do what it did last year? Well, if it goes like it is now, there's no reason why not. Robbie Francovic, still quite confident that the car can do it and that the two drivers are capable of doing it. Back out with fresh rubber and a full tank of gas now, having had a chance to warm up the tyres. Let's see how quickly Thomas Lindstrom gets on the pace. Certainly, he looked very fast around this circuit yesterday. And for those of you who were waiting to see the softball at Lion Red Ballpark in Auckland, the news is not good. The softball is going to be played. They have now decided that New Zealand playing Chinese Taipei will be played at Liston Park in Auckland. So the game is going is actually in progress at the moment. New Zealand down 2-0, I understand. But we cannot cover that match because, of course, our equipment was set up at the Lion Ballpark and it's a little difficult to move. So those waiting for the softball, we won't be covering it this afternoon. New Zealand is currently playing New Zealand, uh, Chinese Taipei and they are 2-0 down at Liston Park. Graham Crosby and Charlie O'Brien. Their battle's still going, but Crosby in front of O'Brien and just slowing there on the circuit may have a problem. But this is second place. Denny Holm in the Auckland Coil and Bullion Exchange Commodore. His co-driver is Ray Smith, the man who owns the car, 
He's down on the pits now. Let's see if we can get a word with him. They must be happy with the performance. Are you happy, Ray? Well, Evan, at the moment, the car's looking good. Dennis is circulating in the low 20s, uh, occasional 19-second lap, mostly 20s and 21s. The car's strong. Uh, Brock's a bit fast for us, but he's going to be pitting earlier than us. Uh, he'll run out of fuel before we do. Uh, that should put us in the lead for a while. It depends on whether we can hold it or not. This is a real tortoise and a hare sort of effort, isn't it? With a pretty fast hare, or rather a fast tortoise out there. Well, I wouldn't quite describe it as that. It gets back to the fact that it's such a long race. It's a race of attrition. The, the car is quick. Um, if we can keep it going, I think we should be there at the finish. No problems, as you know of? No, we're, we're on uh, radio with Dennis. The car's running perfectly at the moment, so uh, touch wood and I hope it stays there. When then is he due into the pitch for the tyre change and the driver change? Uh, we're expecting about 15 minutes we'll be in the change. Ray Smith, the co-driver with Denny Holm, and this car running in second place at the moment, doing exceptionally well, and after 49 laps, the order is Peter Brock in the front from Thomas Lindstrom in the Volvo in second place. In third place, uh, on paper anyway, is Denny Holm and Ray Smith in the Commodore. And in fourth place at the moment is the Dave McMillan per Gunnar Anderson tur Volvo Turbo 240T. Then Alan Grice in fifth place. So bear in mind that the official places that we give you may have changed between the time they were printed and the time that we give them to you with pit stops. And Denny Holm running second on the road at the moment. And as uh, Ray Smith said, they can afford to wait a little longer than Peter Brock before they have to put fuel in. And they seem to have no problem at all with the tyres. So Denny Holm out there and circulating in the low 20s. 120, 120.1. This is the car, the Willie James Toyota Corolla, which is leading the up to 1600 Group A class. And uh, the challenge that we expected from the Adams Wolf Toyota is still there. And then it's the Bruce and Alan Drink Road Toyota Corolla in third position. The Drink Road brothers uh, having their first full season in Group A racing in the right cars Corolla. Certainly the little Corolla Sprinters are a very competitive car in that 1600cc and under class. As we said before, Paul Adams managing to bring home one of them to fifth place where the attrition rate last year was very high. An excellent performance from him, one he'll be looking to be repeating. Jimmy Keogh is still out there in the BMW, but having lost enough laps to make him uncompetitive and uh, just seeing how long the car is going to last for them. It's a beautifully prepared car, that one. Tony, he's, uh, he's been racing, you know, for quite a number of years and very much a guy who really gets in there and enjoys his racing. Hasn't uh, been on the winner's dice for quite some time, but however, um, you know, there's got to be more than just one winner in the, uh, in the field. He's driven all sorts of cars throughout his career. And at the moment, he's got the number 17 John Player Special Ford Mustang there of uh, Dick Johnson and Neville Crichton filling up the mirrors of uh, both the Willie James Corolla. Now the Nissan Mobile 500 starting to settle down to a reasonable pace now. With Peter Brock cruising away, having not had his first pit stop yet to hand over to Alan Moffat, but one imagines that will be proficient as Dick Johnson locks up the tyres under brakes. Obviously pushing the car a little hard now. We'll see if we can get a word with Dick Johnson on a radio telephone. Uh, it looks as though he might be a little busy to talk to us, but we'll try it anyway. Joining us in the commentary position in a few moments, co-driver of car number 18, the Ford dealer team, Sierra Turbo, David Oxen, will be joining us in just a few minutes for a bit of a chat, and we'll uh, be finding out exactly what happened to the British Saloon Car Championship vehicle a great shame to see this car it was brilliant to see it go on a pole position yesterday afternoon in the atrocious conditions here at wellington but however somebody must have done the right thing during the night and uh, we've had some beautiful sunshine here as we mentioned a few clouds up in the hills in the background this is the jim richards john morton t mcmillan bmw bearing some tire scars down the, the driver's door 
which Richards copped in the opening stages of the race, but uh, certainly no damage there. A good bit of rubbing compound will get rid of that. And that's still Richards in the car. Mechanics working quite feverishly all around it. The door open to let some fresh air in there. They're up in the engine department checking the clutch and brake reservoirs. That's the Charlie O'Brien BMW that he's sharing with Glenn McIntyre exiting the picture. And this is Francovic going past Brock to unlap himself. The one Volvo has just unlapped himself from the 05 Mobile Commodore. Thomas Lindstrom out in the car now. Robbie Francovic having done the first drive extremely well. And one imagines that Volvo should be quicker than Peter Brock, who will be getting to the end of his competitive tyre life. Uh, hoping to come in and pit. And a little bit of smoke coming out of that Volvo. Yep, and Peter Brock stopping too. Uh, we've just been advised that he had his hand up there, so he's going to be stopping. But yes, that ominous cloud of smoke that's coming from the back of the Volvo weather. Perhaps it was overfilled when they came in, although I didn't see the bonnet go up. Perhaps could have missed it, maybe. Um, yes, it's still there. There's no doubt about it. It's... Uh, this is certainly not a healthy sign because it's uh, it's getting a little heavier. And we'll just have a look and see if the 05 Commodore comes into the pits. They're on to the bridge. This brings them back onto the start finish straight once again. And there's a lot of smoke coming from the Volvo. He's moving right to, to one side. Peter Brock just sitting in there keeping an eye on everything. And welcome to the commentary position. David Oxen, David, it hasn't been a happy day for you. No, Brian, unfortunately we've uh, obviously had a very short race and uh, we've learnt the true merits of street racing. It's a bit hard on uh, a bit hard on machinery if you get near to the walls, but it appears as if we've had a, a suspension breakage. But let's not lose sight of this battle here that we've got with Peter Brock and Thomas Lindstrom. Any clues as to what the smoke is? You being in the turbo cab now? Well, no, I don't. Uh, last year we made a terrible mistake of picking what was oil smoke from uh, Tom Walkinshaw's Rover. Um, too early to say, obviously, um, it's a lazy smoke. That looks like rear end type smoke. And we do know that the Volvo has had crown wheel and pinion trouble overseas, not uh, deterring his speed. It doesn't look at this point like turbo smoke. It appears to be coming from more around the right front area, actually, Tony. Okay, let's hope that it's going to hold up for Thomas Lindstrom and Robbie Francovic for the rest of the race. But down on the pit is one of New Zealand's best known exports in motor racing, Jim Richards. Well, Jim, we've seen you come in, and I gather there's a problem with the clutch on the BMW. That's right. Uh, for about the last five laps, it's been starting to uh, get a bit hard to change gear. The clutch isn't disengaging. We've, I put up with it for a little while, but then the clutch went uh, rock hard, and I couldn't even depress it to change gear. So we're only sort of getting in everyone's way out there, so I thought we'd better sort of uh, come in and see if we can fix it. You're an extremely good mechanic in your own right. Uh, what would you guess it to be? I, I don't know to sure. It's either hydraulic or the pressure plate has got a problem. Well, if it's pressure plate, of course, it sounds bad. Hydraulics, well, perhaps you might get out. I hope so. Thank you. And as you saw when we came to Jim Richards then for a talk, Thomas Lindstrom brought the Volvo into the pits to see where that oil is coming from. Many mechanics looking busily under the bonnet, checking the oil level. See Randall Edgell there, well-known Auckland race car builder, looking under the mechanic and all of them perhaps at this stage guessing somewhat as to what the problem is. Well, this Volvo that you're on your screen now, of course, um, Per Anderson from Sweden. This is a tremendous drive from this team or from this, uh, this whole entry, the rock gas entry. Not highly respected as they approached the meeting because no one really knew much about the driver and uh, it was put together in a big hurry, obviously, for Gary Pedersen to drive. Unfortunately, Gary broke his arm at the last Vincent in the Hedges race meeting and was unable to drive, but he's down there now looking after the pit work. Unfortunately, Dave McMillan, who is to drive the car, quite seriously hurt his, uh, his thumb in the Formula Pacific race earlier on in the day. 
and there is some concern about whether they can drive the car on the circuit with this torturous turning around the bridge areas. In fact, uh, Gary Pedersen and the Rock Gas team were decent enough to ask me to drive it, but the officialdom thought that it was uh, out of character to do such a thing. So we'll have to wait and see whether Dave McMillan, in fact, takes over the car. Let's see if we can get a word from Robbie Brancevic about what the problem might be with that Volvo. Well, you led for 27 laps, but now Thomas Benjamin again, Robbie. What's the problem? Oh, they've got a um, split oil return pipe from the turbo to the sump. So they've got, to they've got to change it and fill her up with oil. How long will that take? Oh, who knows? Is it the end of the race? I beg your pardon? Is it the end of the race for you? Oh, no, certainly not, but, um, you know, whether we win or not, it's doubtful now. Yeah. Let me just have a, a word to Thomas, if I can. Thomas Lindstrom sitting very patiently in the car there. Thomas, it looks like rain is coming in. Is that going to be in your favour? You go very quickly in the wet, don't you? Yes, uh, I think I'm a very good rain driver, yes. And the Volvo is also very good in the rain. So, you, you, how do you feel when you've been going so well and suddenly you have a problem like this? What goes through your mind? Not that much, uh, really, because uh, I've been so many years in motor racing, I know that everything can happen. But of course I'm disappointed. R Robbie thinks you probably can't win from there, but you can still do very well. Would you agree? Yes. Thomas Lindstrom obviously feels he can get back into the race and certainly rain, I imagine, would help them greatly. Thomas Lindstrom, an excellent rain driver, as Evan has just said. And of course, the rain brings it back to a little more equal for everybody. The rain, the rain obviously is setting in. We can see that the uh, wipers are on now on the car, car five or car seven. That would have been John Harvey, in fact, in your picture. So uh, this is probably going to change the whole character of the race it's setting in over the hills of Wellington we can see it now getting really really steamy out the back it may in fact be very lucky for Peter Brock because he was waiting till 70 odd laps for his pit stop so when he changes tires he can train change straight to wet yes Tony I think probably uh, Peter will be reluctant to go on to straight wets it depends on the actual intensity of the rain he really objects to running full wets uh, because obviously with the soon the circuit dries, they're a disadvantage. So he'd be well covered with intermediates, but uh, at that point we would see Alan Moffat in, so maybe he'll make the choice. Might be a tough decision to make when they come in, because they know that it costs another 35 or 40 seconds if they've got to change their mind later on, but uh, trying to judge whether or not this rain is going to be heavy or light or just drizzle or make the track completely sodden is yet to be seen of a traffic jam there Peter held up by one of the rovers but the track will be quite slippery now and uh, we'll keep an eye on these drivers who uh, will naturally be hot and steamy in the cars and they'll be now faced with this added uh, danger or at least um, competition of keeping the car straight out of the turns making sure that they don't lock a wheel up There's just enough drizzle on that track now to make it very, very slippery on the top. Peter Brock, always an excellent driver in any conditions, will be able to handle the wet as well as anybody out there, as will Alan Moffat, his co-driver. I would imagine for some of the other teams where perhaps one driver is better than the other, it might be uh, a little bit difficult to decide to send somebody out and what tyres to send them out on. But with Brock and Moffat, they'll have it sussed immediately. He comes in. Now they're going straight back out on slicks by the look of it. Well, if I can read those numbers, it's a D5 compound. So that's a D5 grooved intermediate tyre there. That's a softer compound than the D3, which has got 05 written on it. That's a full hard Bathurst tyre. So Peter is obviously just cagey. He's waiting to make sure. But he's covered both ways. Alan that, Moffat getting ready. That's a classic case of boxing, isn't it? Lining up the tyres to go on the car, one sort on one side and another on the other side. Well, that way you can only be half wrong, Tony. And that way you don't give too much away to the opposition crews as to what you go to run. Now, here we've got the pit stop.
number one car in the HGT team, Peter Brock, the race leader, coming in to relinquish his lead, we imagine. He had a lead of around about 40 seconds. Well, it's V3, Slick's going on, so Peter certainly doesn't expect it to be too much of a wet race at this point. He's certainly taking the chance. Uh, they are, are putting Alan Moffat in, so Peter not electing to stay in yet. Well, as we've speculated, it's probably Alan Moffat's decision as to what tyres to put on the car. So something of a gamble being taken by the HDD team on the basis that the rain won't get here as quickly as uh, making the track wet between now and the next pit stop. It's a fairly long pit stop. Car down, and Alan Moffat out. We'll see if we can get a word with Peter Brock shortly. But that's the decision they've made, to go back out on slicks. Preserving that car, it doesn't seem to be a mark on. It's a credit to Denny's driving. He's brought it through into the lead at this point. We'll watch for his pit stop, we believe, at the end of this lap. And there is no question that the rain is going to arrive, and I think uh, Peter Brock might be doing what he had just spoken about and coming back for a set of grooved slicks. Well, as, as much as it's uh, an advantage to have a slick pit team who can um, change the wheels in 25 seconds, the in and out loss is about a minute, so there has to be weighed up before a car is brought into the pits for a tyre change. And in the picture, you might have just seen a glimpse of the Volvo back out on the track. We probably would have uh, Thomas Lindstrom still in the car, but still smoking. So that's uh, it may be oil that's been on the chassis and is burning away. We'll just have to watch this one. Definitely raining quite heavily out there now. They're getting wet in our commentary box as well. Obviously not as much of a problem for us as it is for the drivers. Here's Denny Holm coming in for the pit stop. This is the scheduled pit stop, so nothing awry with his. And it's going to be intriguing to see what Denny Holm does in the way of tyres. Well, I would think with Ray Smith taking over the car, they will play, play for the safety of, a, of an intermediate. I saw the intermediates ready before. When we zoom in, we'll see this. Um, and now the, the choice is a little bit easier for these boys because the rain is a little bit heavier. Yes, that's a fact that's a full wet going on the car, and that is a surprise. Uh, one wonders if uh, Peter Brock and Alan Moffat might have made a slight mistake in underestimating the rain at Wellington here, because certainly by the clouds around and the way the weather is moving, it seems as though we're going to have quite heavy showers here. Okay, the wet tyres are on and ready to go. Ray Smith taking over the corner bullion car and it'll be a battle of wits now to see in fact Ray Smith on wet tyres on a greasy greasy but damp track will have any advantage at all over 05 Alan Moffat on straight slicks now that track with the odd bits of fuel and oil that are left over from all the general public driving on these roads will just be coming to the surface with this rain. Obviously yesterday's rain will have helped a little in washing it clean, but it's still going to be a very slippery surface right at the moment. And you can see just how much some of these cars have had to slow down already. Alan Moffat still out there and circulating. I wonder how long he's going to stay there on those tyres. Well, by my reckoning, which obviously can't be trusted, I would think that the Volvo car number four of Kerr Anderson in the, the white rock gas car should be in the lead because he doesn't appear to have pitted yet. He's got tremendous consumption rate or economy. So that probably would put... Just crossing the start-finishing line now, car number four. Yeah, so in fact, that is the case because after 70 laps, the last official lap order we have saw Denny Holm in front. Now, he's, you've just seen him pitted, so he goes back out having lost a couple of places. He, Denny Holm was leading from Alan Moffat. And down in the pits at the moment, we have Denny Holm. Let's ask him if we can what kind of tyres he thinks are suitable for the rest of the race. 
Well, Danny, you've gone to wet weather tyres. Is it a bit of a gamble, or are you sure they're the right choice? No, they're the right choice. When you come through the gate and on, off the streets onto the wharf, it's really raining very hard over there. In fact, everybody's going at snail's pace. And I envisage that the wind is coming this way and it'll get worse. Well, you're the first to go to wet tyres. It could be a winning decision for you. Well, it's also very close to our fuel stop. So um, we did the combination, fuel and tyres. If there was a gold medal round for, for really crafty, clever driving, I reckon you'd get it. That was a masterful drive. Well, old-timer. <laughs> you still enjoy it, obviously. Yes, very, very much. Yes, yeah. Very much. And of some interest, as we go back from the pits and Denny Holman, his pit stop, is that Graham Crosby in the BMW 635 CSI has worked his way up to fourth place. Volvo smoking just about as much as it was earlier on, but not slowing down Thomas Lindstrom. It may have eased a little bit, but it's un under deceleration and braking. It certainly sets into a heavy haze, and uh, Ray Smith playing himself in. Certainly wouldn't want to lose that valuable place that Denny Holmes worked very hard to earn. There is our fourth man on the road at the moment, Graham Crosby, former double world motorcycle champion. Having made the transition to four wheels quite well, initially in uncompetitive machinery. And there are only two cars on 60 laps. They are Alan Moffat and Ray Smith. First and second. Third car, which is Thomas Lindstrom in the Volvo, on 59 laps. In fourth place is Dave McMillan this stage still officially with Graham Crosby having been relegated to sixth place now. Lap pace has dropped quite considerably. Remembering early in the race it was 1 minute 20 and thereabouts and now we see lap boards for Alan Moffat at 1 minute 30. So 10 seconds loss. It's not obviously on the start finish straight which is comparatively dry. So as Denny Holmes said around the back by the Taranaki gate it must really be slippery. This surface, uh, where it's very uh, smooth top tarmac, must be very, very slippery when you get just a small amount of rain. Well, obviously, Tony, the slick smooth tar seal, which uh, some of our roads in New Zealand have still got, but they're gradually being replaced by the Ministry of Work, by the coarse chip. In fact, as soon as they get a little bit of oil and a bit of water on them, they just become so treacherously greasy. and. Uh, there's a mixture of surfaces here, the best of it being probably down the start finish straight, but out the back it certainly is uh, just the moment a drop of water comes, it's uh, like glass. And uh, earlier on, Al Andy Rouse was saying that at certain parts of the track, water seems to be bleeding up through, the, up through the tar seal and actually making water on the track where it didn't seem to be raining. drivers now having to get to grips with the very very slippery surface and this was our second place man Alan Grice in the pits for the tyre change what's he going to? Well, he's obviously playing it safe he's got two choices there so a bit of indecision there there's uh, a wheel off and no wheels going on so whether it's uh, Mr Cameron the uh, relief driver going to make the decision or so we've got some mechanical work going on in the Master cylinder area, I think. Maybe a um, brake bias was sticking or something. But there's a delay now. In fact, they look to be bleeding the brakes, so it obviously is a brake concern. So this may be a, a development for the Holdens. Very, very fast car, but also quite heavy, and uh, the brake pedal has probably gone very soft for Alan. He said, well, let's get some air out of the system, see if that helps. The rain really starting to settle in now and not looking like easy as the afternoon goes on. So I don't imagine it will be long before Alan Moffat comes in for a tyre change. Just have a look at how heavily the rain is falling on the other side of the track. Very slippery indeed. Far too slippery to be out there on slicks. Well, this is where Denny Hulm will be saying, there, I told you so. Ray Smith's wet tyres will nicely come in now. And uh, the, the W3 Pirelli wet really comes it into its own in these conditions. It doesn't wear at all. It's, it's a perfect wet weather condition. Now, Alan Moffat 
will be cursing his choice if it was his choice and saying, blow it. We've seen now in our private camera that the Volvo is back in the pits. We've seen Trevor Crowe come in, so it's a mixture of uh, pit stops and tyre choices. And this is the time in the race when really it can be an enormous problem be with so many people coming into the pits at the same time. It can get very congested in there. Now, Alan Moffat's still circulating around very, very slowly indeed. Coming in, he's going to have to change tyres. Volvo's in for mechanical attention, not not tyres. They, have, they haven't even bothered to jack it up. And uh, this pit road is becoming so crowded with everyone coming in. In fact, we think that's Alan Moffat coming into the pit road now. Now, this certainly will cause a problem because the area is very, very crowded immediately in front of the Volvo. So here comes Moffat. Now, for, let's watch if this pit stop is one of the legendary HDT stops. He's chosen to go onto an intermediate tyre as opposed to a full wet. It's a grooved D5, very slightly grooved, but enough to dissipate some water. Virtually nobody left on the circuit, as everybody has decided the obvious choice has to be wet now. Nick Johnson coming back out on the circuit. Then comes the Rock Gas Volvo. A whole queue of cars. We see uh, Graham Crosby coming in. So it's and uh, John Harvey or the Neil Lowe entry, John Harvey car coming in. So it's chaos in the pit road. Just amazing how many people there are down there and how many crews are working around these cars to get tyres on and gas in as quickly as possible. There's Alan Moffat out again, and there's John Harvey and Neil Lowe's car with Neil Lowe who was in it back in the pit. Again with the tyre change, it looks as though I think Neil Lowe is going to stay at the car. Alan Grice having changed tyres already back out on the circuit. So bear with us, it's going to take us a couple of laps to get the order for Grice you. Grice has just done a backwards, uh, nice square dance down by the uh, entry to Jervois Strait. It's a three-point turn for him to get off. That's an embarrassing position to be in, especially if there's some cars coming through. It's blocking the whole road at this point. In fact, it may have stalled. Perhaps it couldn't have happened at a better time in terms of the small number of people out on the track. Well, I would say that Alan definitely has stalled. He's being pushed, or an offer of being pushed by the marshal. That's going to block the entire circuit at that point. Well, at least if it blocks the circuit, I guess they can't get past it. Damaged right front uh, lens from an earlier altercation with uh, something immovable. Just caught a glimpse of that car going around backwards. Let's see if we can have a look again at uh, what happened. Just the slippery surface, I think. Turned in a normal way. Probably just got a bit tail happy coming out and just got away from Alan. It's very slippery on the exit. Yes, in fact, he was lucky not to pull out the armco with the left rear, the right rear. Parked very nicely. We probably shouldn't criticise Alan Grice when, in fact, it could have been uh, the, the driver changeover. We missed seeing whether, in fact, Alan Grice stayed in the car. It could be Graham Cameron. So un under these conditions, it'd be unfair on anyone because, literally, it's hard going for any driver, and especially a relieving driver who's going out all hyped up, full of adrenaline. It is Graham Cameron in the car. Meantime, let's go back down to the pits and get a word with John Harvey. He's just been relieved by Neil Lowe. Well, John, down here in the Mo Mobile Holden dealer team, uh, you've had two fairly frantic stops, but it looks as though the rain may be stopping. Yes, well, that's true, and uh, we took the precaution to not put wet weather tyres on the car, but through slicks. They've just got a slight groove in them to uh, give the driver some sort of traction on the damp surface. Uh, wet weather tyres, I mean, would last uh, two or three laps in these conditions. The, the circuit's not just quite wet enough for wet tyres, so we're pretty happy with the situation at the moment. So if it got heavier, they could handle it, and if it eased up, they could stay out there for a while? Well, certainly if it uh, eased up, they could handle it all right. If it got wetter, I mean, really heavy rain, well, no doubt they'd have to come in for wet tyres. We've taken a gamble on this, but at this uh, stage, we think it's paid off. They say races that are lost in the pits, not one on the track, don't they? Oh, there's never been a true statement made, Evan. <laughs> Harvey just acknowledging that uh, you can win or lose a race very easily in the pits. 
not only on how quickly the pit stop is, but particularly in a situation like this where you have to take a gamble on what tyre choice you make. Now, the HDT team seem to think that the rain is going to ease. Uh, it's looking a little showery on this side of the circuit at the moment, but raining more heavily at the other end of the circuit. Well, our update from our official tells us that car five is leading from car two from car six, so that would put the Moffat Brock entry in the lead from Denny Holm and Ray Smith, and the Grice Cameron Holden Commodore VK, the sleepyhead car, but we all already can see that uh, there's something more terminally wrong than just the result of a spin. It either won't start or there was a problem which caused the car to spin and therefore the retirement or current retirement, the visible retirement of the um, Dale and Grice entry. There's an update after 76 laps. The Brock Moffat Commodore in the lead from the Smith Holm Commodore, Crosby McKinnon in the BMW 635 and the Grice Cameron Commodore was in fourth place until their retirement just a few seconds ago. Lap 76 was going to be the lap that the Ford Sierra stopped for its scheduled tyres and fuel, but uh, obviously it didn't make the whole distance they required, and uh, that's what this race is all about, keeping the car mechanically alive through all the conditions, keeping those pit crews really well drilled, uh, not, not always perfect conditions, not always can you do the model pit stop because of someone in your bay or the, or the wheel nut jams in the gun or something like this, but uh, certainly at this point, Brock Moffat seemed to be in control of the race. There is the Crosby McKinnon BMW disappearing out of sight as Alan Moffat circulates around, still in the lead in his Holton Commodore and in the wet with groove slicks on and obviously not getting the kind of traction he would like at that end of the circuit. Well, that's the area I would have uh, probably disagreed with John Harvey on that uh, certainly in preserving the car, I think Ray Smith made the right choice in electing for wets because uh, certainly half the circuit is uh, slippery, but half of it is, uh, sorry, half of it is reasonably tractable, but the other half is shockingly slippery and wet. That's all very well to think of the life of the tyres, but that's not a lot of good if your car hits a wall. Dave uh, McMillan appears to be out now in the uh, rock gas Volvo, so we'll watch his progress with interest after his unfortunate uh, hand injury in the Formula Pacific race. And uh, Tony, you've got some new positions. Positions after lap 77, with uh, our lead car having taken a little bit of a detour. Well, that's what happens when, when you try and extract the utmost out of your intermediates when really it's wet. And uh, it's very, very hard for Alan to temper his uh, aggression when it when he knows that he wants to get on with the job and he has to ease back a little bit for the rain he's worried about preserving his position and just the slightest overstep causes the front brakes to lock and immediately loss of steering and the place and if a man of Alan Moffat's ability and experience is out there and losing it in the wet I'd say it's wet wouldn't you well we're back to the conditions we had in the closing stages of the flying lap competition it's a, a semi wet and, wet and uh, soaking track in certain parts and uh, a bit dry in others and, and a slight drizzle in the air just to keep things interesting. The order after 77 laps is Brock Moffat in the lead. This is the lead car. The Holmes Smith car still second with Ray Smith in it. In third place, the McKinnon Crosby BMW. In fourth place, at the moment, we have Trevor Crowe. And in fifth place at the moment, Dick Johnson. Neville Crichton in the car at the moment, I understand. So we'll watch the progress with interest of Alan Moffat. Already had one spin. Obviously, he won't want to repeat it. But knowing that he's got to stay in that lead, and at the same time, preserve the car these kind of conditions it's so easy to lose the car hit a wall and really be down the drain as far as the race is concerned but the difficulty of uh, driving slow enough to keep the car on the track is that somebody else might be slightly braver or have slightly better adhesion with the tires behind you i 
think if uh, Denny Holm had still been in the car out there that the gap between Alan Moffat and Denny Holm, particularly with the tyre difference, would have been a lot less now. We understand that uh, Ray Smith has in fact taken over the lead on the wet weather tyres from Alan Moffat after the spin. There's another one. It's certainly getting quite crowded on the entry to Jervois straight there and uh, I would say that that's a that's, um, little Ford Escort, of course. That's the um, Jim Clark former B entry, and uh, there was a lot of glass scattered on the road there, so it's certainly becoming a treacherous little area around there. In practice, it was the slipperiest point of the track, even when it was just slightly wet, so I imagine it's just uh, impossible at the moment. down in the pits let's get a word with the man who was going exceptionally well in a hard charging drive from way back on the grid and had the misfortune to come off Alan Grice well Alan you're running very high up and uh, Graham had a spin but I believe there was the most unusual reason for it yeah, it looks like it I haven't spoken to him but he, he got out of the motor car with a gear stick in his hand so obviously that's uh, the gear sticks come out broken off they're gonna fit another one but obviously that's why he spun you weren't carrying a spare gear lever in the kit with you. No. You seem to be plagued by bad luck. You have such good performances in the early stages and then things go wrong like this. Yeah, we're chasing something in the brakes too. The brakes weren't working terribly well. But they were okay. Um, you know, I was still running on the tyres. And this little bit of a bump in the front, I was following a BMW through the, uh, the gates up there under the straight just before the chicane. And uh, you missed the gear right when I was on full power and I just, you know, give him a whack at the back. How many cars do you reckon are likely to finish this race? Maybe not a lot, a lot the way it's going and the traffic is terrible. The traffic is terrible. Um, you know, I hate being critical of, uh, of things in motor races because that's what I do for a living. But these slow cars are just straight out dangerous and, and they detract from the racing because there can be a, a good dice going on, you know, with two or three evenly matched quick different cars and drivers and you can see the tactics coming into it there's a real good battle going on and they come across three or four wombats in little billy carts and the three drivers are all split up and then the crowd lose the spectacle of that very good dice tactical dice you know it's a shame for the crowd and the, and the sport but you'll be back next year oh, i think it's a great race yeah three little bumps they fix on the circuit it's pretty good well, while we're on the subject of Alan Grice's wombats and billy carts, let's come up to date with the class places in the up to 1600cc class, being led at the moment by Paul Adams and John Wolfe's entry. In second place, the 42 car of Mark Jennings and Dave Barrow. And in third place, we have the 89 car, the Piper Champagne car, of Gray McGregor and Bob Holden from Australia the Toyota Sprinter. So Toyota Sprinters 1, 2 and 3 in that class up to 1600 at the moment. Well, as Bob Holden is the only wombat in a, one of these billy carts, as he calls it. I don't know, Alan. There's only... Uh, <laughs> I know what he's getting at, though. In practice, uh, it certainly was a problem once you got into the drift of a, of a dice with one of uh, your compatriots in an equal power car to come up on two or three of the slower cars. It's uh, not the ideal circuit for a mixed-class competition race. There was enough big cars to make this a straight-out feature race on its own right, but it's the same for everyone, and that's what we all have to go through. Yes, one imagines it doesn't give any great advantage to any driver in particular. And having updated the up to 1600 class, there is another class here from 1600 to 2.5. In the moment, it's being led by the number 26 car, Chris Castle and John Billington, from in second place, the number 33 car of Bob Barry and Chris Heyer. And in fourth place, the car number 23 of Don Halliday and Gary Croft. Probably never ceases to amaze us all that in spite of the thousands and thousands of dollars and the man hours that go into preparing a car, that in fact something as simple as a broken gear lever or a bro broken throttle cable can cause the retirement of such a, uh, an expensive and valuable car. But such as the load that the driver puts on items, such a thing as a gear lever is getting worked tremendously hard and uh, it has to be literally changed very, very often in its racing schedule. And uh, most teams carry spares, but uh, you know, you could go right through the whole car trying to preserve every chance of uh, finishing a race, changing everything, and sometime, at some point you've got to take a chance. 
Earlier on, we saw a picture of a rover up against the wall. Now, try and find out what exactly that was. One of the rovers was parked. There it is, and back in your picture now. It's the Ron Wilkinson Armand Hane car. Who were, they were going very well indeed, but they've had their share of problems. They were in the pits for a lengthy period earlier on. And they've obviously decided to park it there out of the way and off the racing line. Well, it's certainly becoming a bit little, little strewn, the circuit, with cars in areas like this. Naturally, we can't uh, poke them through a hole in the wall because there is no hole in the wall. That's made that a little bit tighter now, and it'll be uh, almost single file for the cars approaching the bridge. Trevor Crowe there doing battle with Charlie O'Brien on the track. Well ahead of Charlie O'Brien. And down in the pits, we've got a man who just got out of the car, having had a hard charging drive, Dick Johnson. You know, things were going very badly for you when you came in earlier on, but it, everyone else has been in since, haven't they? Well, it looks that way, Evan. Uh, when we first came in, it had a loose uh, bolt came loose, which holds all the front wheel bearing together, and the brakes were disappearing. So I thought, rather than run out of brakes around this place, I better have a look. We fixed that, and I think we've driven back up into second, by the way, it seems, because I think Denny Holm was second, and I passed him again. And uh, we've since come in and put a set of tyres on, but uh, Neville's doing a good job now. Speaking to Alan Grice a while ago, and Alan, as you know, is not noted for his diplomatic language. He referred to some of these slower drivers as being in billy carts and wombats. How do you feel about it? It's obvious Grice hasn't been here before. <laughs> Oh, well, look, it's, it's a very tight circuit. I think you've just got to have a little bit of patience and, uh, and I think, uh, keep your temper a little bit cool. Otherwise, you're going to do some damage to yourself rather than those guys. So, you know, it's, it's a bit difficult, I know, but it's the same for everyone. You've been around a long time. Can you win from where you are? Oh, certainly. Like, uh, the race is far from being over and the car is running superbly. Like, the, the little Ford is just buzzing on like you wouldn't believe. And uh, I've no reason to doubt that uh, we'll be there at the end and very, very high up and hopefully first. When are you getting back in the car, Dick? Uh, we're going to try and keep Neville out there for about 85 or 90 laps, uh, depending on the weather, of course. And uh, then I'll get back in and go to the end. What cars are you running on? Wet weather? Uh, at the moment they're wet and the circuit, the way it is, with a lot of oil and stuff down, they should last reasonably well. But uh, if, if they start to wear a little bit, all he's got to do is uh, get himself into the wet patches and keep them cool. Well, the rain started to fall very heavily, so he might be on the right rubber for the rest of the race. Well, I hope he just hangs in there. Thanks, Evan. Dick Johnson with the co-driver Neville Crichton out there at the moment. Neville Crichton, a man that uh, has improved out of sight in the last two or three years with a lot of race miles under his belt and now considered to be in that top class of saloon car drivers capable of running with any of the top entries in this Nissan Mobile 500 race, wet as it is at the moment. There's a high and wide shot just to show you the weather conditions that prevail. We thought it might have been drying up, but the rain has kept in here fairly constantly. And I think that John Harvey and Peter Brock's optimism about the weather clearing up is perhaps because they live in Australia. We have Dick Johnson unofficially in fourth place. In fact, Neville Crichton, of course, in the Dick Johnson, Neville Crichton car. So he'll be well pleased with that. Um, very unspectacular race in terms of not uh, getting mixed up in any dog fights or hitting anything. Neville doing a good job. And as he, as Dick said, he knows the task ahead of him is to stay out there for 85, 90 laps. And that's a long period under these conditions. So it's a, a real test of Neville's ability and his concentration. As Andy Rouse said earlier on, the concentration required under these conditions is enormous. He'd never experienced anything like uh, a, a race on a circuit so tight as this with all the possible hazards of uh, cars in the way, walls on the outside of you and, uh, and now rain to just complicate things even further. I wonder how Neville Crichton feels being in the Mustang having run this race last year in a BMW. And after 85 laps, an update on the placing, still Alan Moffat in first place in the Moffat Brock Commodore. In second place is still Ray Smith in the Holman Smith, and there's Neville Crichton just spoke, gone straight ahead. Spoke a little bit soon for Neville. He um, probably did what we always uh, worry about, the, the 
last minute lock up and lose the steering but no damage done probably only lost him five six seconds just enough to gear him up and remind him just how slippery it is no doubt about this track now it's totally wet tires and i feel sorry for anyone running on anything but those tires going through that order again alan moffat in first place at the moment ray smith in second place trevor crow in third place and this car with Neville Crichton in it in fourth place at the moment. Fifth place at this moment is held by car 41, which is Paul Adams. And we might be seeing a repeat of last year where Paul Adams managed to bring the little Toyota Sprinter, despite the fact that it's in the 0-1600cc class, right up to fifth place overall. And that's where he's sitting on the road at the moment. Great drive from Paul Adams. Well, after the initial burst of all the entrants away from the start there, when Peter Brock and uh, Thomas Lindstrom, sorry, Robbie Francovic and Andy Rouse battled it out, they settled into a pattern. And I think deep down they all believed what this race was going to be about was just surviving the first four hours in some sort of form that would allow them to really exercise their skills in the last hour of the race. And now certainly all those skills have been drawn upon by these drivers literally to weed their way through the slower cars, keep on line, preserve the rain tyres to their best life. Certainly no worry about looking for wet spots because it's just soaking wet everywhere now. And uh, the race is going to develop into a real contest. Brian Lawrence, it's amazing what some of these drivers can do, particularly a driver of the ability of Paul Adams, as we have Leo Leonard for Bruce Anderson. We're not sure which of them in the car at the moment. Check it just a moment. And it's gone around. And Derek Ongaro, the circuit inspector from FISA, the controlling body of motorsport, will be watching accident incidents like this with, uh, with some concern because that actually is getting close to track blockage material. Obviously, Andrew Bagnall or Paul Radicic and a little escort there took evasive action and uh, avoided an incident. But if two cars did that at that point, it really could cause chaos. There you see one each side of the Pipac car. And if Alan Moffat is still out there on intermediates, as we assume he is in car 05, he's doing a grand job just to keep that car pointing forwards, let alone keep a position number one. Next time they come around, we'll get the gap for you between Alan Moffat and Ray Smith, first to second. And there in third place, Graham Crosby and Lou McKinnon in the BMW. And this is Alan Moffat. They'll be around across the bridge this time. I would say there's a possibility they may look at changing the tyres. I think they're really pushing it uphill if they think this weather's going to lift in time for them to take advantage of the slicks. Actually, Graham Crosby and Lou McKinnon will be very pleased with their current position and third overall on the road. They started from grid number 11 after qualifying in a time of 1 minute 23.5 compared to the 126.9, of course, the pole sitting time. But we must remember that the 11th down the field teams were, um, were in the dry conditions and of course when we come to the flying lap that was run in conditions pretty similar to um, to what we're seeing now this is the BMW 635 at the moment it's Lou McKinnon at the wheel and we just hear from the pits that car number one the Thomas Lindstrom Robbie Francovic car that led very early on in the race and has been in the pits several times since is now 20 laps down so any chance they had, realistically, of winning the race down the train, I think, and the gap between first and second, between Alan Moffat and Ray Smith, is 57 seconds. That's the gap between first and second, 57 seconds. So obviously Alan Moffat doing enough at this stage to stay ahead of Ray Smith, but one wonders, David Oxton, you really must wonder at the tyre choice and how long they can stick with it. Well, I think probably Alan will be waiting probably for an instruction. The usual situation is the pit says to the driver, well, if you can drive in those conditions, please stay out there as long as possible. And uh, 
it's a hard choice for him to make. A 57 second shoulder at this moment would allow him to stay out there if it stopped raining. And it doesn't look like stopping raining, I must admit. Totally wet, as we say, as you can see in the screen. And Peter would be a bit worried about seeing a 50 second, 57 second lead evaporate. And Ray Smith is doing quite a tidy job in driving the uh, coin and bullion car and holding up the honor for Denny Holm in tremendous style. Certainly Alan Moffat finding the turn around the tight hairpins hard going. He doesn't get at all taily, but he's visibly slowing slower than he should be, obviously, at this point. Around about 20 seconds a lap off the dry pace. Now, that's quite a lot. Normally, we would expect on a circuit like this, 10 to 15 seconds loss of time, but 20 seconds off the pace, and now I think he has a visibility problem. He's fogging the screen. We saw him wiping the screen on the inside, so another concern for the uh, competitors, fogging of the screen and losing vision. Now, a lot of things have changed since earlier on in the race. After 20-odd laps, we only had two cars on the same lap. Now we have the first four cars on 89 laps. The rest of the field further back on 88 or 87. But only four cars, the first four cars on 89 laps at this stage. Both dealer team cars running in unison at this point. And we believe both on the same tyres, although the dealer team have got all their wet weather tyres ready. And uh, as we say, probably leaving the choice to the two drivers. But what a traffic jam. And there's the Gulson car with uh, Ed Lamont, I think, at the wheel. That's obviously a well-separated wheel. And he's making it around the corner quite well. Amazing what you can do on three wheels. Of course, uh, this is the car that had the engine failure during qualifying for last year and uh, only just made the race last year with a an ordinary road car engine dropped into it which was loaned from a dealer in Auckland and of course they were looking for much better things and the ANZ Alfa Romeo this time Ed Lamont a man who spent a lot of time behind the wheel of a Ford Laser Sport during the Laser Sport series and very much a hard charger but under conditions like this it's uh, it's certainly a tall order from a driver to keep things on the island and still keep some very competitive times in there. But uh, going by the look of that, David, I don't really think that this car is going to make an exit from the pits. No, the damage is always severe in those situations, as we saw with Graham Balkett's car. It's not a matter of just changing the wheel and a steering joint. It will push the suspension back and bent the strut. So uh, bad luck for the team. I think he's done a marvellous job just to even get it back to the pits and uh, he probably doesn't know what angle that wheel is on. He just feels that he's got uh, one wheel steering and the other one's just there for the ride. I think it's a pretty good advertisement for Alfa Romeo's, isn't it? To be able to drive around on three wheels. Save money on tyres. The Volvo entering the pits just ahead of the Alfa Romeo, so uh, literally they are probably using the time now to try and sort out the problem. Obviously, literally uh, out of the results. 20 laps behind, even even in normal circumstances, there's a, there's a long gap to make up. But in comes car number one. Bit of a talk with the driver, rolled it back. We aren't opening the bonnet at this point, so uh, it's back on to a tyre change by the look of it. The car's up on jacks. Pit road very busy, as you can see, just like your average garage on a busy day. Well, obviously, anything can happen in a race like this of 204 laps around this Wellington Street circuit. As Ed Lamont and Ray Golson try and repair that car, looking at the damage. Doesn't look very healthy the way he can pick up that hub. There's Trevor Crowe. The 05 car. Still circulating at good pace. That's Tony Longhurst at the wheel at the moment. It's the darker overalls of the two of the drivers. Very hard for us to tell. With, with these unscheduled stops, the drivers change their mind about who shall drive when, so we literally have to play it by ear on who's at the wheel. But both Tony Longhurst and uh, Trevor Crow, excellent drivers in these conditions. They're uh, well used to them and uh, taking a, a, a bunch of seconds there off Alan Moffat. So uh, obviously the right tyre choice in his mind was to uh, use wet tyres. Alan Moffat has to be stroking it now to preserve the car and really just uh, try and stay out there and keep it straight. And just hope that the rain will stop. A 
according to our uh, latest lap score, that would put Tony Longhurst in the lead of the race. It is so difficult to tell with these drivers pitting all the time to change tyres, coming in and out for mechanical problems. We'll get an update on it in just a moment, but as I make it, that was Tony Longhurst taking over. Obviously, we have some problems with the conventional methods of lap scoring at the moment. We'll update it as we come back. Meantime, let's have a look at the highlights. Tested there for a moment in saying that he had taken the lead because it would have taken an enormous amount of catching up to have put him in the lead. In fact, he's just unlapped himself into second place. And so, Alan Moffat still in the lead, holding tenuously to it as the 05 car slithers around in the wet. And the sun has come out since you've been away. So, Tony Longhurst in second place at the BMW. In third place is Ray Smith in the Commodore. And in fourth place at the moment is Lou McKinnon in the McKinnon-Crosby BMW. Just uh, a lap down at the moment. There's our race leader. Just being passed by a number of the drivers in here on wet weather tyres but still hanging on to the lead because all those drivers were at least a lap some of them two laps down so Alan Moffat really having something of a decision to make fairly shortly the sun has come out again and the track may dry but he's losing places flat out at the moment Alan Moffat, I think, is hanging on and looking at the weather and hoping that it is going to fine up and dry up for him, in which case he's away and racing again. But he's losing a lot of places, and it's only because of the substantial lead that Peter Brock builds up initially and the fact that the Thomas Lindstrom, Robbie Francovic Volvo has spent so much time in the pits where it is again. They've lost something like 30-odd laps now. So they're out of contention. And the first and second cars when they were running together when Brock was running with Robbie Francovic they pulled out an enormous lead on the rest of the field and started lapping everybody and they'd lapped all but two cars uh, by about lap 50 so then when the rain started coming down and Alan Moffat decided to go out with grooved slicks rather than wet weather tires he's lost places but not enough to lose the lead yet see now that the track is starting to dry slightly and that the weather looks fine for a little while I doubt that that's the last shower we've had for the afternoon but Alan Moffat taking the gamble as they did with fitting those tires in the first place and knowing that uh, if the weather does dry out they're going to be in luck again let's go down now with Evan Green to the pit road and have a talk to Holden's team manager and the team manager is Tony De Gennaro. Tony, it's a very difficult situation out there. And the weather seems to be clearing up. But is Alan Moffat going to make the decision whether to come in or will you tell him whether to come in and change tyres? Well, at the moment, it's his decision. But uh, that may change in the next few laps. I'm not really sure. It looks like it's clearing at the moment, but we're not sure what's going to happen. It's one of these moments where races are won or lost, isn't it? Exactly. But that's a long way to go, though. So. Yeah. It's a lot on a, the driver to have to decide that, but I think Alan Moffat has the experience to know whether he can handle conditions, but he's been passed by a lot of cars. Exactly. But as you say, he's got the experience and he knows what to do. What tyres do you have available for him when he comes in? I can see two down here. Let's just have a look at them. Yeah. Well, we have the choice of uh, a Dunlop full wet tyre there, and we have our own grooved uh, uh, Pirelli slicks there which uh, are quite good in the wet too. Now, both those give more grip in the wet than the ones he's got at the moment. Yes, they do. But if it's really bad, he'd go for these ones here. Only the... in very heavy rain, yeah, that's right. So you'll have to, when he comes in, you'll have to ask him what he wants exactly. and then fit them and get him out as quickly as you can because that's that lead right. is shrinking all the time, isn't it? Yes, that's right, exactly. We'll do it as quickly as we can, but again, it's in his hands at the moment, so we'll have to wait see what decisions he makes in the next few laps. This is your first job as, or your first time as team manager for a big race with the team, isn't it? That's right, yes. You chose a good race? I certainly did. <laughs> but, um, we'll be okay. Okay, thank you very much. Tony Gennaro. So there's still some confidence in the Holden dealer team that 
even if they have to make a decision fairly shortly and they do decide to change tyres they'll be able to do it quickly enough not to cost them too much in the way of advantage so there's the order after 92 laps Brock and Moffat in the lead Alan Moffat driving at the moment Ray Smith driving in the Smith home Commodore in second place and Trevor Crowe and Tony Longhurst with Longhurst driving at the moment in third place Graham Crosby and Lou McKinnon in fourth place with Lou McKinnon at the wheel at the moment this is our race leader Alan Moffat obviously hoping it's going to dry out for him he can see the circuit drying out underneath him but uh, as I said, I doubt that that's the last shower of rain we'll see for the afternoon. And it looks like there's some more of the dirty weather coming in from across the strait. Obviously, some bigger gaps around the circuit now between these cars. Alan Moffat hanging on to it beautifully. He's only lost it once that we've seen in the wet. And that cost him about nine or ten seconds overshooting the corner. Quite interesting. A little talk there with the Holden dealer team about who makes the decision whether or not to change the tyres and in this case they're leaving the decision to the vast experience of Alan Moffat on all kinds of circuits in all kinds of countries in fact Tony the signboard that went out to Alan Moffat two laps ago was a, a chalkboard with written on it wet and a question mark so obviously uh, they were prompting Alan to give a serious thought to it but as it's uh, a virtually very very fine drizzle at the moment it's um, probably made the choice a little bit easier for Alan if he was able to put up with it earlier on it's certainly a lot better at this point I guess that's always worth considering if you're driven through pelting rain and slick tyres and it starts to get a little finer it must psychologically mean well if I could stay out then I could stay out now There's still the order is Alan Moffat from Ray Smith from Tony Longhurst, from Lou McKinnon. After 98 laps. The 1600 to 2.5 litre class. After 94 laps, the first car is the 26 car still as it was before. Chris Castle and John Billington. Second place, car 33. It's Bob Barry and Chris Meyer, 130 TC Arbat, and in car 23 in third place, we have Don Halliday and Gary Croft, and in the 0 to 1600 class, no change in that either, car 41, still Paul Adams and Alan Wolfe in the lead, it's been a change to second place, second place is now held by Brian Bates and Dennis Roderick in car 91, and in third place, having been relegated from second, the Mark Jennings and Dave Barrow in the other Toyota Sprinter. Ray Smith doing a great job in the coin and bullion car. Ray not, not done a lot of driving and uh, obviously lives a little bit in the shadow of the former world champion, Denny Holmes. And certainly this race is uh, proving to be one of Ray Smith's better drives of all time very difficult task to go out there on a demanding circuit like this street circuit and to drive in wet weather as David Oxton said he has lived somewhat in the shadow of Denny Hull and often has thought been thought not to be as good a driver I think he's proved today that uh, he's certainly learned how these group A cars work and a very courageous drive in the wet now there is the race leader and there's Ray Smith behind him our bow lap charts are right at the moment. That is the amount that 
Ray Smith is caught up with his wet weather tyres on Alan Moffat on the slicks. And if he's catching up at that rate, that, as I make it, will be the lead if he can get close to him and close enough to pass. He's catching at an alarmingly fast rate at the moment with the better tyres. Well, this is an awkward time for Ray Smith because without having experience at dicing for the lead, literally, uh, he'll have to be very careful how he approaches the corners and not get himself sucked into a, a costly error. He's doing a, a great job, and if he keeps this up, literally, he'll be... Um, well, in top favour with Denny Holm, his, uh, his teammate. And certainly uh, no sign of any tension or errors on Ray's part. He's got a few cars in his way, and that's all there is, as we understand it, between himself and the lead, currently held by Alan Moffat. Ray Smith still picking up the pace, driving exceptionally well for an inexperienced man in the wet, handling this car beautifully and hasn't looked like hitting a wall, and closing very quickly on the leader, Alan Moffat. Still gambling out there on the wet, hoping that the weather is going to fine up for him. Let's go down to the pits where Evan Green has Trevor Crow, their team currently sitting in third place. Well, Trevor, there might be two Commodores scrapping for the lead, but you and uh, the BMW with Tony Longhurst driving at the moment are very well placed. Yes, well, we think so. We were hoping really for rain, although it's not good for the crowd. It's uh, better for the BMW. And, uh, you know, Tony's doing a great job at the moment out there. He's actually catching up a little, I think. And uh, it's halfway now, and we're either third or, or close to it. And uh, the car's running beautifully. What are the tactics from here on? Well, we've got to leave Tony out as long as possible. I had to come in early because both the bonnet pins broke with the rough surface and the bonnet was coming up under braking. And so we had a, an early stop we didn't need. And then when it rained, I came in for a tyre change. Thanks very much, Jeff. OK. Right, the first four cars are all on the same lap, so this is the challenge for the lead. Ray Smith, having come in and changed the wet weather tyres, Alan Moffat still out on the grooved slicks are only slightly better than straight slick tyres. So on this surface, drying as it is at the moment, this is the biggest chance that Ray Smith has ever had in a saloon car. A challenge for the lead of the distant mobile 500. Well, realistically, he's just going to uh, fly by by comparison. But he'll, um, he'll certainly have to watch his P's and Q's because it's, um, it's a trap for young players of any sort out there at the moment. It's just taking the move at the wrong time might be uh, now there's a bit of a crafty move by Alan in fact he was moving across to get past Philip Meyer and the escort so that's all right but uh, Ray will have to leave it uh, a little bit that slowed him down considerably and uh, lost some of the ground that he'd made up in fact taking a tight line into the corner to maneuver past the escort this is probably the most pressure that Ray Smith has had on him since he started driving saloon cars well, we have the first four cars now on the same lap after lap 100, which is just under half distance, in fact. We have first car five, obviously, Alan Moffat at the wheel. Car number two, Ray Smith, the Golden Holden, in place two, at least at this moment. Car 31 with Tony Longhurst at the wheel, the black BMW, then place three, and not on your screen at the moment, and some distance behind the Lou McKinnon Graham Crosby entry, car number six, the yellow BMW. So BMW Holden's first and second, BMW's third and fourth. And there's the Pine Pack Mustang appeared to be parked just before the Taranaki gate. Now we've got Trevor Crow, or sorry, T Tony Longhurst, also in this battle. Now if we read this right, he's just taken second place away from Ray Smith. So realistically again, give it only a couple more corners and we're going to have that black BMW in the lead and that's a that's a position a lot of the pundits were predicting for the BMW they said you wait till two or three hours are gone and the, those BMWs which you've written off as being competitive group A cars will be back in the lead and look at this that's certainly a brilliant drive coming from Longhurst I've just been watching him out there on the circuit just lurking away in the background just picking up a couple of seconds here and a couple somewhere else 
and um, he's certainly putting together a very very smooth drive there's the number four rock gas volvo there which has been driven by the swedish driver per gunner anderson and new zealander dave mcmillan but um at just over two and a half hours of the nissan mobile 500 tony longhurst of queensland at the archibald bmw 635 that he's sharing with trevor crow has taken the lead they qualified uh, fairly well down sorry yesterday they were in fifth position 1 minute 28.7 compared with the pole of 126.9 a relatively and simple passing maneuver there for tony longhurst to get past alan moffat and moffat has now been relegated to third place have a look at how much faster they can go approaching this little corner Tony Longhurst obviously confident he could get past and still get around the corner. Ray Smith sitting back for just a moment, but have a look at the corner coming up. There's Longhurst taking over the lead of the race at the halfway point from Alan Moffat and the Holden Dealer team. And that is simply through tyre choice. When they were running in the dry, there's no way the BMWs were competitive with the Commodore in the early stages of the race. And there Ray Smith goes through as well. Almost getting squeezed on the outside, but Alan Moffat with no answer because he's got no traction. I find it very hard to believe that somebody with the experience of the HDT team have left Moffat out there and just watched this lead just whittled away. It just, it seems so ridiculous. Either they're supremely confident that the track is going to dry out, or they're supremely confident that they can drive back from behind, but it does seem like a silly maneuver they had an enormous lead there and you know even if they had have come in then and changed to wets and it had have been um, perhaps not so much an incorrect decision but had the circuit have dried out the um, they would have still had that that lead and they would have had plenty of time to change wheels on the car but uh, Longhurst is no slug wet or dry and he's doing a brilliant job just look how much he's just driven away but that's exactly what he's doing he's just driving this race like there's nobody else there he's pulled out a tremendous buffer there on uh, on Ray Smith and the Commodore, and, and look how much he's pulled away there from uh, Alan Moffat. Now, Alan Moffat must be feeling really quite helpless out there because, as we had told to us by Tony Di Janeiro, the HDT team boss, the decision was left with uh, Alan Moffat to decide whether or not to come in and change tyres. They held out a pit board saying wet weather tyres and a question mark beside it. He opted to stay out there and obviously thought the weather was going to dry up and up for his grooved slicks to give him the advantage. But those that fitted the wet weather tyres have obviously pulled a big advantage. We've watched the dealer team's lead being whittled away, and there's the sad faces. And I think now that they've, uh, they've got the tyres lined up and are ready for a change again. So after lap 104 laps, Tony Longhurst leads from Ray Smith, from Alan Moffat, and Lou McKinnon. For all that, though, Tony, we've got to keep in mind that uh, the race is only half distance, and uh, with the attrition rate we saw in the first two and a half hours or thereabouts, it's um, it's a whole well to, to hold open contest from now on. Sure, there is uh, an element of doubt as to whether Allen should have stopped or should even stop now. But we've still got to see another driving spell for Peter Brock. We, we do believe that he is the fastest car left in the contest with the demise of the Sierra and the Volvo. And uh, at this point, probably the advantage of the wet tyres is slowly but surely evaporating. You can see there's quite a dry line through that section there now. So certainly the, what is going through Alan's mind is by coming now and change to wet tyres and have to go out again for a short spell before I come in for Peter to take over, then it's only going to lose more time. And as we said, probably uh, the whole exercise in and out is a loss of 40 or 50 seconds. Even at best, the pit stop to change tyres, if overall time lost, is somewhere around a minute. So even with one minor mishap, you could lose an entire lap with coming in to change the tyres. And it now remains to be seen if it does fine up how long those wet weather tyres will last because they're really only good for two or three laps if it is absolutely dry. So long as there's some moisture there to keep them cool, they'll be okay. But if the track dries up and all the lines are dry, then they're not going to last very long at all. They'll start to blister very quickly. But just looking at the times now, Longhurst has pulled out some 16 seconds on uh, Ray Smith in just that very short space of time. 
and uh, and the turn has taken some 27 seconds off Alan Moffat. So this really does seem a rather ludicrous situation. But the crew are down here, although everybody's at the ready in case uh, he decides to come in. But there um, doesn't appear to be any notices going out on the board to advise him of that. Looking at the dealer team blackboards, we see that uh, Alan Moffat has got lap 30. So whether we think we think that's lap 30 to go at the wheel. And on the Neil Lowe, John Harvey car board, it says lap four. So we're, we must be looking at a pit stop coming up soon. The comparative lap times for the two Holden dealer team cars, uh, Neil Lowe, 135, Alan Moffat, 1 minute, 37.7. So uh, nothing much in it there. Around about 15 seconds off the pace. And uh, maybe J John Harvey, Neil Lowe have got it worked out better because they've in fact only got four laps to go to make their tire, tire choice decision at the schedule stop and it almost makes makes us wonder whether it's almost too late to make the change you might as well run out the course of the stop and uh, the course of this spell and uh, not waste too much time in the pits on an unnecessary stop now ray smith is actually coming into the pits in our picture now the golden holden now that seems to be a bit early to me because i saw denny holm not many moments ago at the other end of the pit with his helmet off so what is the problem The Harvey Lowe Commodore, having just gone past the uh, the Brock Moffat car, just drove past him down the straight line there with ease, and also just looking down from our commentary position into the pits, the uh, the Ed Lamont ANZ Alfa Romeo that you saw making uh, a rather Great. unscheduled stop into the pits there. Um, they're still carrying on repairing the car, and they continue to go on. But here's Ray Smith going back out again. We're not sure um, exactly what he came in for, but it was a very short one indeed, David. We opened the left-hand side doors, uh, Brian. I don't know whether it was, um, certainly wasn't time enough for a cup of tea. Maybe there was something rolling around the floor that was getting under his pedals, or uh, maybe one of the gold bars that he carries on the floor as ballast got broke loose. So Ray Smith having dropped back to fourth place now with a chance a little while ago a challenge for the lead. He didn't get there quick enough because Tony Longhurst got to got to uh, Alan Moffat more quickly to catch him up and got past him. Leading its class, the 1601 to 2.5, car number 26, the Chris Castle John Billington VK Commodore. being waved madly out there let's go down to the pits and see if we can find out what did go awry with uh, the Denny Holm car early pit stop well Denny what that you're holding in the hand well Ray just called up to see he's coming in a big hurry and this is what he had in his hand um, the gear lever's broken off as you can see and he's had a little lever about that long now the remains it's going to be very difficult for him we sent him on his way now we're going to get some vice grips when he comes in, if he can cope with it for a while, we'll clamp them on and it'll probably be my turn to go out. Let's have a look at that end again. It looks very sharp. He's going to cut his hand on that, surely. It certainly is. The boys are also arranging to put some rag over and tape the end, see if they can get a, you know, a better grip for him. How long is the lever that's left? But only an inch or so. Only about an inch or so. But it, the gearbox is very nice, and if he's kind to it, he should be able to change gear. Now, do you know where you are? Because one thing that's common down the whole pit area is people don't know where they're running. It's a lot of confusion, isn't there? Well, we think we're number one on the road. Um, that might have altered it, that quick pit stop then. But uh, because, just because um, Bob has got the penalty, we're not sure where we are. It's going to be quite a burden on your shoulders when you go out down here, isn't it? Well, I'm hoping like anything's going to dry. Then I can give it a real stir. Denny Holm, hoping it'll dry up so he can have a real go at this car. He still loves driving the saloon cars. He's a very precise driver, but still capable of driving very, very aggressively too. And uh, as you've just had explained, Ray Smith has quite a problem there with a very sharp end and very short gear stick to change gear. As Denny Holm said, it's quite a kind gearbox to the changer. So uh, he should be able to circulate out there at reasonable pace and continue. Not far away from a stop now for Ray Smith to come in anyway, for Denny Holm to go out again. 
And uh, Denny Holm, as he said, hoping it'll dry up so they can put dry tyres back on and go out and go for it. But uh, the way the wind is looking overhead, I think uh, there's still the odd shower to come. Well, with all the early pit activity, we missed one of the uh, stops for the Holden dealer team. In fact, John Harvey is now out in car seven, replacing Neil Lowe. And we can see, in fact, that he's uh, done seven laps in that car. So that was uh, obviously seven laps ago, the changeover occurred. And about three and a half seconds a lap faster at this moment than his teammate, Alan Moffat. He's running one minute 32 laps against Alan Moffat's one minute 36. And the, there are dry spots on the circuit, so it's not so bad for Alan. He's not having to fight the conditions quite as badly as he was, but uh, we'll have to remain, we'll have to wait and see, in fact, if Alan chose the right decision by staying out. You can see how the wet tyres have been pumping the road reasonably well dry, although uh, when you look down the start-finish straight, there's still an awful lot of spray coming off the uh, the tyres here. This is the number seven Commodore, driven by John Harvey. And the relative gaps now between first, second and third, from Tony Longhurst back to Alan Moffat, that's first to second. The gap is 40.42 from uh, Alan Moffat back to Lou McKinnon in third place is 21.8 seconds and from Lou McKinnon back to Ray Smith in third place one minute and six seconds so after that you're getting back to laps down that's quite a big gap though for uh, Alan Moffat to try and catch up again Well, the rain's really starting to come down now on the start-finish straight, so I think that uh, Moffat's definitely going to have to come in and do something about those tyres unless uh, they've decided that they want to run in second position. But Longhurst doing a brilliant job out there in the BMW. This is Neville Crichton in the John Player Special Ford Mustang. A very steady drive coming from the Aucklander. And dare we say it, the rain is definitely here again. Certainly it favours the chances for the BMW team. Two very close, closely matched drivers, Tony Longhurst and Trevor Crowe, both experienced enough to know the conditions. And of course, here's Graham Crosby, not to be underestimated, in the uh, Trans-Hasman insurance car, car number six. That's fourth position on, on the road at this point. On the same lap, although quite spread out in that lap, of course, but a very good... Uh, performance by Graham Crosby obviously well known as a motorbike rider and he's broken in gradually into the saloon car brigade and then graduated right to the top of the tree with a BMW 635 top car for this sort of race very reliable and holding up the honours for the German it's Mark. It's McKinnon in the car It's Lou McKinnon actually in the car at the moment making his way back down the start finish straight again the car bearing a few battle scars on the back you can see the rear bumper bobbing up and down there but uh, david there's actually very few cars on the circuit that haven't got uh, a little bit of panel damage that's right brian the the, uh, the damage there obviously the left rear bumpers caught an armco somewhere it's very very easy to run slightly wide just give yourself a bit of a bump in fact both sides of the car there's a few bearing missing lights and remember last year we had the Volvo which didn't seem to have anything left on one on any of the corners it was um, the bonnet was coming up and the park light lenses were falling out but really speaking with these treacherous conditions I think the, dr the driver's done a remarkable job there's very little accident damage and they're obviously respecting each other's abilities to uh, have their own race so remarkably little accident damage well, certainly terminal damage. There's a little escort there with a bit of road rash on the front. The Dick Johnson Mustang, Neville Crichton driven at the moment car. That's uh, unmarked. That's a credit to those two blokes that have um, gone through a variety of conditions and kept their noses clean. It's a beautiful looking car, brilliant black paintwork. Now we see the 05 car coming in now. Obviously it will have wet tyres put on and we suspect that Peter Brock will get in, but let's watch this. No, Alan Moffat staying at the wheel. That's very unusual, but maybe Peter's decided that he would run out of the laps allowed, remembering the drivers are only allowed to do a maximum of 135 laps. And we know the race is 204. 
So Peter's elected to stay and leave Alan in the car. Alan furiously getting signals to get that sticker off the window because it's been jamming his wipers for quite a while. Wheels on, and off he goes again. Alan Moffat on wet tyres, thanking his crew and ready to charge out on the track. That was a very rapid change that went on then, David, and uh, Moffat has been gambling on tyres. Obviously, he decided he'd lost, that the gamble hadn't been worthwhile because eventually he came in and took out the, uh, the real wet weather tyres to see if he can unmend some of the damage that has been caused in this last half hour of the race. He, he was uh, confused, I suppose, by the weather, as most of us in the pits were. It just was terribly hard to tell whether the rain was going to cease or whether things would get worse. He just didn't know and decided he'd wait out there and see. Well, he'd had trouble, as you see, Graham Crosby has had trouble also. Probably wishes he was back on two wheels. Almost was. He was in third place. Got the car going again. Doesn't seem to have caused any damage. Oh, yes, there's a bit of a flap at the back. Maybe no more than superficial, though. The bumper at the back has hit something and been torn. You'll see as he goes past. Just an update on the positions at lap 111. First, car 31. Trevor Crowe, Tony Longhurst. Tony Longhurst at the wheel. Car, car 5, second, with Ray Smith at the wheel. Car 2. Sorry, car 5, obviously, Peter Brock, Alan Moffat car in second place. Car 2, third for Ray Smith. And car 6 in fourth place, the BMW of Graham Crosby, Lou, Lou McKinnon. We don't believe he would have lost any places on that little spin. In fifth place, we have car 17. And that's actually one lap behind for the John Andrew Ford of Dick Johnson, Neville Crichton. So uh, one lap behind, not a problem at this point. Remembering we're only just over halfway. And the, wet, the rain really set in again now. It's back to exactly what it was an hour ago, half an hour ago. And uh, certainly wet weather tyres are the norm. Yeah, diabolical conditions out there at the moment. You can see a lot of tail wagging going on. Moffat's just staying in front of the smaller car. Not so bad for the drivers of the small cars. They haven't got the same weight, the same problems with maneuverability and the same demand on their tyres as the big, powerful, heavier cars have. But if ever there was a race that may well be decided by the weight of the car or the choice of tyre, it could be this. Do you agree, Brian Lawrence? I certainly do. You know, these guys are really doing a commendable job. And uh, we were just discussing the amount of panel damage that's on a lot of the cars that the Crow Longhurst one is unscathed at this point. And, um, Let's hope that it stays like this. These smaller capacity cars handling the situations here very well. Of course, um, we're going to see them fairly well up on the leaderboard, the same as what we did last year. It's been a race of high attrition, without a doubt. We've seen some very notables go out. Andy Rouse and the Sierra. Um, he went out in the early stages. Alan Grice is gone. Graham Balfour's gone. The Jaguar went out with a, um, another expensive engine failure. Um, they certainly won't be very happy about that. We believe it was a very expensive engine that was put into the car. It was due around about November and it was only fitted late last week and uh, their race was indeed a very, very short one. But this is the race leader, Tony Longhurst of Queensland in the BMW that he shares with Christchurch. Trevor Crowe, a man who's very, very quick and well remembered for his efforts in the Oldsmobile-powered Toyota Starlet. Well, to put Tony Longhurst drive into perspective he's coming up to lap ray smith and it's not that long ago probably 15 20 laps ago that we were talking in terms of him taking the lead away from ray smith now obviously we know that ray's had a pit stop and uh, thrown out his gear knob but um a tremendous drive by young tony he's showing um what a good aussie driver and a good bmw car can do in a funny little track like wellington in the rain He's driving it as though it was in dry conditions almost. He's one of the youngest drivers in the race. He's 28, and there can't be many younger than that. But he is full of confidence. I was talking to him in the pits about an hour ago when they were back in the field, and people weren't taking much notice of him. And he said, in half an hour, we'll be in front. He was about to take over. He didn't mean because he was driving, but he said, that's when the other cars come in. It's going to rain, and we will go in front. And here he is. The race now more than halfway gone, and he's right where he said he'd be. The race order after 114 laps is Tony Longhurst from Ray Smith, from Alan Moffat and Lou McKinnon. Tony Longhurst going past just as easily as that. My goodness, he's getting around this circuit so quickly, Tony Longhurst. Well, he's 
got the traction, obviously, Tony, hasn't he? He must have the tyres as well as the balance in the car because the difference was absolutely graphically demonstrated for us there where he just circled around the Commodore there. Obviously, Smith was having trouble finding grip and Longhurst just swung around and almost with contemptuous ease drew away. I think perhaps the uh, broken gear shift may have unsettled Ray Smith just a little. A relatively inexperienced driver in these saloon cars. Doesn't have a lot of race miles under his belt. And now that uh, Longhurst has got past him and he's got something in front of him to chase, we might see a little bit of an increase from him in terms of the pace. What we might see, though, or what, we might, what might be happening, rather, is he can't get certain gears. The reason he was passed in that corner could have been, say, that he couldn't get second gear and just went round in third. And if I was driving with a broken gear shift and had a cut hand, hand as he probably has, I'd be very tempted to miss a few gear changes myself, I think. What can you do in conditions like this, David Oxton? Well, I believe that the drivers are doing a marvellous job just staying on the road. They're certainly not enjoying the drive. There's no way you can actually get a real thrill out of racing around the circuit like this. It's hard enough in the dry to keep concentration. But when you've got an added hazard of traction and side bite, uh, obviously some fog inside or mist inside the screen, and, uh, and then throw in a little hazard like a broken gear lever, it's certainly not going to be one of the most pleasurable races for any of the drivers out there. But uh, it's still a motor race. It's still a motor race to be won. And it's still one that several drivers out there can win and want to win. Something perhaps that we underestimate a little is the lack of vision in the wet. I am talking of lack of things. I think we might have lack of gears there by uh, Smith. He slowed right down. I think he's probably groping to get the right gear or else the lever has let go altogether. But this could be the end of the race. He's putting the brakes on, so he's still under control, but he's stopping. And Smith is stopping on the track. The man who was leading the race, coming second, is getting out of the car. And that looks like the end of a brave effort, unless he can do something to it. Yes, he's going to try and get under. And I tell you, if I was out there getting under the car, I'd be getting under from the other side, not on the traffic side. Well, that just may be a reoccurrence of one of the problems that put him out of the B&H race uh, when the gearbox literally exploded, the Gertrack gearbox with the Australian gear ratio improvement set which split apart he's obviously looking in the gear rear area of the gearbox he'd be looking for that little telltale piece of aluminium that breaks and falls on the ground he's obviously trusting his fellow drivers to stand on that straight and what is a precarious area for anyone to be in so what, is, what is the actual fault with the gearbox david you're quite familiar with these cars the uh, gear set which has been homologated for the group a holden uh, was obviously one that peter Brock had uh, made specially suited for Bathurst. In fact, it's different ratios and different metals used in the uh, the makeup of the gears as as the originals made in Germany. And uh, there was a certain amount of problem during the B and H series with some of these gearboxes, and uh, it may well be showing up as a weakness. It actually breaks the lay shaft in half. That's the lower gear and the uh, lower gear shaft and the gearbox, and it just literally loses drive causes something like about $11,000 worth of damage in the process. It's a very expensive transmission to repair and uh, usually does a lot of damage. And that looked as though he just slipped by the Dick Johnson car there. In fact, almost took the nose off. Some interesting times as we watch these two cars, by the way, from our uh, lap scorers. Since uh, Alan Moffat changed to wet where the tyres went back, his times have improved quite remarkably. Before he uh, came in for the new wet weather rubber, he was circulating around 1 minute 36, 1 minute 37. Since then, he's going around 132, 133. So he's picking up something like four seconds a lap, and that's going to make quite a difference to the outcome of this race. I think most of the locals here would have assumed that once it started to rain with the sky as it was, that there would be a continuation of rain. And I know in both John Harvey and Peter Brock said that they were optimistic that it would fine up again and that their tyre choice would be right. They paid the penalty for it, and they're doing the hard work now to try and get back toward the lead. Well, Tony Longhurst's ploy at this moment, I would believe, is knowing that the form of the other cars is not to be able to run as quick as him, he would be trying to capitalise on that and make as much ground if he's literally pulling away by what looks like about two or three seconds a lap from the field, then he's going to, it's going to be the easiest two or three seconds comparatively that he will ever get therefore if he builds up this big shoulder and extends it even more it's going to make it that much harder for the HDT team to catch him even if the conditions did dry and I think we miss we must bear in mind also that his co-driver Trevor Crow will certainly not be any disadvantage if Tony Longhurst can go this quickly you can re pretty reasonably assume that Trevor Crow will be right on the same kind of pace 
with the demise of uh, the Ray Smith Denny Holm car, at least temporarily, as far as we can tell. That brings Dick Johnson up to fourth place. Well, should we say? And Dick your Johnson screen just now. Had, a, had a little bit of a waltz there, hasn't he? And pulled out in front of one of the Holden Hill team cars, which they wouldn't have appreciated, I don't think, but they slipped by him. We better be fair to all you Australian fans. It may not be Dick at the wheel. I, we can't tell. It could be Dick jo Neville Crichton, of course. We're always, we always come unstuck after the race with these fellows, and they point out to us, hey, it wasn't me at the wheel. So uh, to put the record straight, We'll allow Neville to have one quick spin and back on the road, still in fourth place. Yeah, I think it was Neville. Dick is still in the pits where he was when I saw him just a few minutes ago. So we'll say it's Neville Crichton who had the had the spin. He's staying well within reach of uh, the car in front, though, of the Holden dealer team car. So he's making amends. He lost one place, but still going around at the same sort of pace. And Dick Johnson's very chirpy about this car. Like most in the pit area, he doesn't know where he's coming, but he assumes he's in a place in which he can win. So we now only have Tony Longhurst on 117 laps. Everyone else in the field is a lap down. That includes Alan Moffat, who's in second place, one lap down. In third place is Lou McKinnon, one lap down. In fourth place is Ray Smith, one lap down, almost two down. And in fifth place, car number 17, Dick Johnson with Neville Crichton driving at the moment, and they're two laps down. Well, we can assume they'll move up a place because these the Smith home car is not going to move for a long time, so we can say this car now is in fourth place, rather cheekily slipping in front of a, a slower car there to try and maintain the, the gap between itself and the Holden dealer team car just in front. So up into fourth place goes Neville Crichton, and uh, I think that Dick Johnson will be pretty happy with that. Still a long way to go in this Nissan Mobile road race, better than the 1600 to 2.5 litre cars in most uh, circumstances and certainly on this little circuit. It's a four valve per cylinder motor, 1600cc twin cam, the same as goes in the little Corolla hatchback sprinter. They really have made amazing advancements. It seems to be a very reliable car. It handles beautifully, stops very well. And the one that uh, Paul Adams and his father-in-law, Alan Wolfe, are driving, the number 41 car in similar colors to this in the same Toyota team, uh, is also used for Group A rallying. So a very versatile car in its use as well. It's very much the sort of car that I think Toyota are going to build more and more in the future, Tony. I was at the Toyota factory in Japan a year or so ago, and they told me there that they preferred to go this way with four valves per cylinder and double overhead cams than with turbocharging. Whereas some of the other Japanese manufacturers, Nissan, Mitsubishi and so on, will turbocharge Toyota favour the multiple use of valves. And we've got a good example of it here in this car of Paul Adams. There are nine of the little Toyotas in the race, which makes them the, the second most popular entry. There were ten Commodores entered, and then nine small Toyotas. And then if you go through the numbers, you find five of the BMW 635s, uh, four of the Ford Escort RS 1600s, which are contesting the small car class with the little Toyotas. And then a mixture of sort of small numbers. There were two Volvo Turbos and two Rover Vitesses, two Mustang GTs. You had two Fiat Ritmo 130TCs. And then single entries of the Jaguar, the Sierra XR4 T1, and they're both out of the race. The one Capri 3 litre, one Mazda RX-7, one Nissan Bluebird, which is still out there, and one Alfa Romeo, which became a three-wheeler for a while, but has now got its fourth wheel back in place. So that was the, the field. and nine of these little Toyotas taking part, dominating the small car class, both in numbers and in the way they're going round. And this little Toyota you're looking at now, car 41, with Paul Adams at the wheel, is seven laps down on the race leader, Tony Longhurst, but still in eighth place overall. Now, bear in mind that Paul Adams brought one of these cars in very similar trip to fifth place overall in last year's Nissan Mobile Road Race. They're obviously a lot more manoeuvrable around a tight little circuit like this than some of the bigger cars. They're lacking a little in the horsepower, but their acceleration figures are very good. And being a light car, it means that they can brake a lot later than the bigger cars. Paul Adams, a very experienced driver, both on circuits and at rallies, and certainly knows how to get the best performance out of one of these vehicles. One of the things he likes about it, he tells us, is that you don't have to do too much uh, tweaking and tuning because it's a little black computer box and either it's right or it's not and it's a plus or minus job in terms of tuning of about plus or minus nine percent 
for it, so Paul all you Adams. need is a, a screwdriver to tweak it. Paul Adams, of course, assisted in the driving role by his father-in-law, Alan Wolfe, a tremendous peddler. He's been around for more years than we care to remember. He's a very competitive man, mainly does it for the enjoyment of motorsport, but very, very successful at doing it too. Actually well, marking the... 30 years in saloon car driving this year. Alan Wolfe. I was going to say, in all the uh, mother-in-law jokes, we'll have to start some new ones now in view of this sort of relationship. I've never heard of a fellow racing with his father-in-law. I've heard of him racing away from his father-in-law, but never never sharing the wheel. Now, Alan Wolfe, in fact, says the biggest problem he has in this car is that Paul is so much taller than he is that when he gets in the car, he can hardly see over the dashboard. But a very good peddler who, as we say, has been around for 30 years in saloon car driving. He takes up the co-drive. Paul Adams in the car at the moment. Meanwhile, our race leader is Tony Longhurst in car 31, the BMW 635 CSI, which he's co-driving with Christchurch's Trevor Crow. It's Charlie O'Brien and the 05 car. Alan Moffat. Just looking at some of the lap times here that uh, have been turned in over about the last... 10 or 15 minutes, Tony Longhurst is still circulating in the 1 minute 32 second bracket, Alan Moffat some 4 seconds behind him, John Harvey uh, a little slow 1 minute 41, Neville Crichton consistently doing 137s Graham Cameron in the Alan Grice Commodore, they've got that one going again, they've been out there for about 15 or 20 minutes, he's doing 136s and Lou McKinnon in the BMW that he's sharing with Graham Crosby doing around the 136 second bracket as well and back out on the circuit is the little Alfa Romeo GTV that we saw coming in with the badly deranged left front wheel. They've got it mobile again, and everything looking fairly rosy for them out there in these very damp conditions. Well, while we're watching some of the big cars, let's just give you the position after 125 laps of cars in the 1,601 to 2,500cc, in other words, the mid-car class here. He's been led by car 26, which is Chris Castle and John Billington in a uh, BK Commodore. Uh, car 33 is um, Chris Heyer from Australia and um, Ed Lamont in a uh, Fiat 130 Arbath. No, John Billings, I'm getting my, my lines mixed up. It's a Fiat Arbath in second spot. And in third place, car 25, which uh, confuses me because I can't find it on the list of starters. So there we are. We've got a car that's not there that's coming third, which is just uh, shows what sort of a confusing race this is. Oh, uh, dear me. Pit Road looks very quiet at this point. Obviously, we've lost uh, a reasonable amount of the competitors, so quite not quite the tension and business as there was. There's the Alfa Romeo back out on the road there, the Ray Golson, Ed Lamont car, so they've effected a left front suspension change. You've got it back out there. They probably figure, well, we've come all this way. Let's nail it together and get it to the finish because for the crews, for the entrance of the cars and the sponsors, just to actually finish a race as torturous as the Wellington Street race is obviously a, a magnificent effort and uh, obviously looking a little bit battle scarred. The familiar race tape, which is used for an enormous amount of jobs of holding cars together, doing a great job and uh, back out there in the fray. 